Afternoon. It's uh, 5:03, Tuesday, June 13th. Special City Council workshop. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And acknowledge that the press and public were duly notified of the meeting in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Nicole, you want to do roll call? Sure. Councilmember Bergosian. Here. Councilmember Hahn. Councilmember Myers. Here. Councilmember Ward. Here. Councilmember Streetman. Here. Councilmember Thompson. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Pierce. Here. Mayor Pounds. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. First item is citizens' comments. Ms. Terry Hack. Good evening. My name is Terry Hack, and I'm representing Wild Dunes LLC. Thank you for your continued work on the proposed noise ordinance and the many other important issues facing the community. As you are aware, the resort has been working diligently to mitigate the noise that may impact nearby homes and conducted a based sound study in February. The second sound study is currently taking place. However, the rain and thunderstorms the past couple of days have not helped. The weather and the raining weather is compelling us to conduct yet another study the weekend of June 24th. While costly, it's the only way to ensure the data is accurate. This current study and the next will provide readings that are typical of the summer season, large groups, and a social wedding on the 24th. We will provide you with an executive summary of the study, which will prove vital in determining whether the 75 decibel is arbitrary number or is appropriate noise level for groups and social activities. Passing the noise ordinance prior to receiving the executive summary is premature. Wild Dunes agrees with the IOP Public Safety Committee in asking you to delay any action until the, the resort's study is completed and also agrees with hiring an outside municipal sound consultant. I recognize that this has been on the agenda for many months, but encourage you to wait until the studies are completed and the summaries are presented so that realistic measurements may be assigned. Without real data, the current conditions, there could be unintention, unintentional consequences from this ordinance. I encourage you to use all available data to find the best solution, not the quickest. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Mr. Uh, Klaus. Al Klaus, Three Grand Pavilion. Waiting for written assurances regarding enforcement of 925 the noise ordinance regarding amplified music. We still have not received anything from the council. Requesting Mrs. Anderson to recuse herself from all issues regarding the noise ordinance as it relates to the resort, Wild Dunes, and the city. Requesting an opinion from the South Carolina Attorney General's office regarding her situation. Respectfully, regarding two inaccurate statements by Mrs. Hack, in a previous council meeting, she stated we designed and built in 1999. Subsequently, in a later council meeting, stated we designed and built in 2020. Attached is our IOP certificate of occupancy dated 12-31-2018. What does it matter when we build our home in a residential area? What, what's the difference? Regarding the letter from Regarding a letter from Mr. Jack Smith of Nelson Mullins, the legal counsel for the resort, dated May the 8th of 23, which I have possession as a result of Freedom of Information Act, there are a number of inaccurate statements made by Mr. Smith. They are as follows. One, quote, there appears to be one individual who has had multiple interactions with the police, the 9-11 service, and with Wild Dunes concerning allegations of noise violations. Our response. <coughs> Emails reflect several who have had interactions. I have a well-documented history dialing 886-6522 per the direction of Lieutenant Robert Forsythe in 2021, <coughs> never ever using the 9-11 service. Number two, quote, unfortunately our efforts to involve this individual 
in conversation or to find time to speak and try to understand one another better have been rebuffed. Now, I am here to tell you, I cannot give you the name of this individual, but his initials are Al Klaus. <coughs> Response, prior to Mr. Smith's letter, we met with Mrs. Hack <coughs> twice. We conditioned a third meeting predicated on receiving certain criteria from Mrs. Hack. She did not totally meet our conditions. However, we did meet with her on June 6 of 23. June of 22, we initiated a dialogue with Mr. Smith comprised of a phone call and various emails. Finally, Mr. Smith agreed to meet with us at the resort to hear the situation firsthand, unquote. Identifying, quote, after the 4th and will aim for that Wednesday or Thursday afternoon. Subsequently, Mr. Smith ghosted us and never responded to us. Mr. Klaus. <clears throat> Mr. Klaus, you can wrap up your comments if you'd like. I mean, Thank it's like a 15, 20 second warning. Thank you, very good. Uh, uh, apologize, <laughs> uh, I've already used up my time here. Uh, number three, uh, quote, we would seek to work with the city and closely cooperate to make sure that we are in compliance with the ordinance. Our response, they did not care about the above in 21 and in 22. It was not necessary because the city did not enforce the ordinance, which has resulted into a nuisance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura Levins. Good evening, Laura Lovins, Five Links Clubhouse Court. I'm here to, tonight to open a conversation between the community and council regarding septic tanks on IOP and their possible impact to the environment of the island. This is a conversation that has started in many coastal communities and it's in a very important topic. I wanna to be really clear, I am not here tonight to say that current septic tank owners need to switch to the city sewer system. That's not why I'm here. We know that the water table is rising. We know that the temperature of our ocean water is rising. We know that there are more frequent named storms and higher rainfall amounts. I don't know if any of you were to the beach area between 46th Street and 53rd Street on May 19th, or again on, May, on Monday, June the 5th. On both occasions, that stretch of beach had been cut into three lakes with water over 17 inches deep. The area in front of the citadel had standing water almost up to the high tide line. And in both of those days, the kids were using <coughs> boogie boards to play in the lake. <laughs> um, none of those were due to named storms. Uh, the storm on May 19th, what, it, there was a storm and there was a storm surge that night uh, that caused the super flooding on the 19th. And then the water event on June the 5th, it was due to a king tide the night prior. In both cases, it took almost a week for the water to absorb into the ground. And if, I realize it's a big if, but if there had been a faulty septic tank issue in any of the homes along 46th to 53rd, there could have been a very bad environmental accident. DHEC says that a septic system that is in good working order will pose no threat or problem to the community. And that is exactly my question to the community and to council. What do we know about the septic systems throughout IOP? Does the homeowner and the, with the septic system have it checked regularly to make sure it is in proper working order? Has the horizontal and vertical separation of the septic tank been checked and updated to make sure it's still in a safe location? Groundwater is often overlooked in discussions of sea level rise and coastal flooding, but it is becoming increasingly clear that it is a critical, critical discussion that we as a community need to address. I'm urging council to begin to address this issue as it relates to our community's large septic system and make it a leading part of the environmental agenda. Thank you. Mr. Santiago. Santiago, 
another 60 ocean point. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want to thank everybody for putting together the Desert Administration and Council for the data on SDRs. I think that's extremely important. We have good data to make good policy. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute more. One of the things that I would ask you to do is we had a discussion here in late, almost December, I think, in one of the meetings when Ed Fitzpatrick spoke in the garden, the representation of second home owners here on the that do not have SDRs. We're continuing to represent them as investment owners, which clearly they're not. They're second homeowners who choose not to rent. Uh, and they should have communicated that way from now on, because it's misleading to say the least. I own a second home in Charleston. I don't rent. I'm certainly not an investor. It is my personal second home. I pay 6% like everybody else does. So if we would clean that up, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, additionally, I think data is critical. I've said this to you before that we need traffic data, much better traffic data, so we can make better policy decisions again, just like we do with SDR. Three locations I've asked to have permanent traffic counters put in. Ideally, the city controls it, IOP, not some other jurisdiction, which sometimes they just don't work when they want to have those counters work. But sometimes they do work miraculously. <laughs> Those locations would be the connector again. It would also be Sullivan's Island to IOP, and it would be 41st and Palm to the resort. I think then we have a sense of what's really going on in the island on a permanent basis. I think that's critical. Um, lastly, I want to encourage everybody to continue their support for enforcement. I think it is a critical issue. Uh, enforcement of parking, enforcement of SDR violations. I am still kind of confused about SDR violation processes and systems, so that's where I'm going to reach out to you to get a clarification. I want to communicate it to the residents in a way that they know how to do it appropriately so that we really get true enforcement there. And lastly, I think enforcement eventually here to put some guardrails on SDR is critical when we talk about it. Looking for solutions, I put an article out, you'll see it in the Islander, with ideas on some of these topics and really wanting everybody to give the council ideas. It's enough to complain, but we need that solution now. We need to pivot. So that's it. Thank you for that's all. Did it. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you all. Next item is special presentations. We've got two representatives from our uh, coastal engineering group, Coastal Science and Engineering, Stephen Trainum and Patrick Barineau. Thank you both for coming. This is tying to um, item 6B1 on the erosion down at the breach inlet side. So, Stephen, we'll let you take it away. Thanks for coming. Yep. Yeah, happy to be here. And I understand you'll have a full agenda, so we'll try to keep this pretty quick. Um, Steven, um, just make sure you're, you want to pull that mic up a little bit. There you go. Um, so we're here to discuss some recent erosion that's occurred at Breach Inlet. Um, this kind of dates back to a little bit earlier in the year, but over the past two weeks, we've really had a, um, some more high tides that uh, have been discussed a minute ago um, and some. Um, erosion events occurring, especially right at the corner of Breach Inlet. Um, fortunately, it's, it is a fairly isolated area, but uh, discuss that, discuss what the city's options are if they are looking to, um, the city or homeowner's options, looking to do anything to mitigate some of the erosion occurring. Um, I will scroll back uh, to look at, this is the very southern end of the island at Breach Inlet. We've highlighted three years, um, three separate years of uh, photographs to show how conditions have come and, and gone. And just to highlight that anywhere near an inlet, um, the state designates as an unstable inlet zone. So this area, the state is designated as an unstable inlet zone because beaches near inlets are known to change because of changes in the inlet deltas. As the deltas evolve and move and shift uh, around, shoals change positions and that can cause um, isolated erosion events or accretion events to occur. And oftentimes that's completely separate from whether the larger beach system is gaining sand or losing sand. An area can be gaining sand, but still the beach can be eroding landward um, because of changes in the inlets. And we think that's what's going on here because overall there is a positive sand supply moving into this area. You can see in the top left image, that's a 2019. We've highlighted one walkover um, to show that at that time the beach was fairly eroded. There had been an event prior to that. Um, this area um, just east of here was uh, heavily impacted by hurricanes Irma and Matthew, and we, we did some scraping projects to rebuild the dune uh, along much of the Breach Inlet Reach going up to about 7th Avenue. When is that picture in 23? 
This was taking taken last week. Last week, yeah. Are these last all at the same tide? Uh, no, they're not at the same tide. So the one at the top left was um, likely at a much higher tide. Bottom left was the uh, was a low tide picture, and it looks like the right one was about a mid tide. Um, so certainly the the water level is kind of independent. We're we're looking at the where the wet sand line and the vegetation line is is really kind of the indication of what the condition is. Um, but in 2021, you can see it was a much healthier condition. We had some accretion occurring in this area. Um, but by now in 2023, it's obviously eroded back again to the, a little worse than the 2019 condition. Similar view looking at the other angle, um, 2019 in the top left and 2023 in the bottom right. Um, Again, you, you can see on the left picture that there is more of a stable, or there is some dry sand, or kind of call it modestly dry sand that shows there's there's more sand in the system, and the profile was actually a little healthier than it looks. We may have had an event that set the dune back. The water goes back out over a period of a couple of weeks. The sand dries out, starts to rebuild the dune. And we're actually seeing that as you go further up coast, um, even today, we were just out there a few minutes ago, uh, there's already some dune recovery occurring kind of north of Third Avenue. It's really the area south of Third Avenue that we haven't seen any recovery occurring yet and that they're still heavily impacted. Um, I will jump back. The, the good news is there's still a lot of dune area between structures, the majority of the houses and the high tide line. Now there are some pools that are getting fairly close. I think there's maybe two lots where the pools are within about 20 feet of the high tide line. And that 20 foot is critical because that's what the state considers an emergency condition is when the high tide line's within 20 foot of a structure and they include a pool or a golf course in that. Um, looking at the, the delta, and this is, again, we're, we're talking about changes occurring in inlets and oftentimes it's very hard to say, you know, cause and effect precisely when you have such large scale changes occurring in these deltas. Um, but we do monitor the delta of breach inlet every year for the city and we can kind of see how the, the the shoals are shifting more towards Sullivan's Island, which is a completely natural process. Every several years, we get a break in the shoal, and you can kind of see that in the center image. I don't have a uh, laser pointer to show, but in that center image, you can see a, a dark channel right here. That's a new channel that formed between 2019 and 2021 and kind of starts the cycle over again. The same thing happens to a much larger scale at the east end of the island. We call these you know, channel avulsions events and shoal bypasses. So this is occurring at breach. And as that new channel starts migrating towards Sullivan's Island, it can draw sand off a of breach inlet. Um, there's also some smaller features that we've highlighted um, where there's a deeper hole forming uh, right next to the beach. We call that a marginal flood channel. That's expanded over the past couple of years, which could also be contributing to the erosion, especially with this northeast weather event that we had. It can kind of funnel water right through that channel, which can draw sand off the beach. So right now, that very tip of the island has these forces kind of working against it, uh, which is probably causing a lot of the erosion. Um, just a vertical image to kind of compare where we were in 2021 to where we are in 2023. And so what's, what's the, <clears throat> the lines you have on that? So the lines we have on that are the state OCRM uh, baseline and setback line. Okay. So that's the state jurisdictional lines, and that'll tie into something we'll talk about here in just a second. <clears throat> but you can obviously see a loss of the dry sand beach, which again can kind of be a little tricky depending on what tide you look at the photos and what the recent weather conditions are. Um, but you can also see a landward movement of the low tide line, but these images were low tide images. Um, if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's obviously some sand that has lost, been lost at that low tide area. Um, so it, it's just one of the unfortunate parts about living and you know, trying to manage a beach around an inlet. Um, so to discuss some potential causes and, and some potential options, one thing we have been tracking is, you know, the sand supply to the inlet. We've been tracking sand moving from the 2018 project area in Wild Dunes. And you can see uh, in Reach 5 and Reach 6, the volumes have been going down. That's the project area. In Reaches 3 and 4, which is the beach north of the pier, volumes have been going up as sand has been moving down. And in Reach 2, which is the area from about probably 4th Avenue to the pier. Uh, volumes have been fairly stable. They've been lowering a little bit, but starting to come up this past year. 
But REACH 1, which is the area right at the, the tip, really uh, took a hit this past year from 2022 to uh, 20, I'm sorry, 2021 to 22 when we last measured it. Um, we're getting ready to do our, our next survey, so we'll be able to update these tables. But um, really the thing to notice here is as these are going up, that sand moving from the north of the island to the south of the island, which is, you know, your nourishment projects have been feeding the entire island. Um, but these changes and these scales uh, that we're seeing aren't related to this bigger, you know, island sediment transport. It's the localized effects of the inlet. Um, another question that I know um, kind of came up was when we did these scraping projects several years ago after the storm, could that have caused problems, you know, now five years later? And really, um, it's, it's not... Uh, possible that that happened. The, the scales that we were looking at is we moved about four cubic yards per foot of beach, meaning for every linear foot of beach, it was about four yards that we shifted from the low tide up to the high tide. The scales of change we see year to year on any of these stations can be 20 to 30 cubic yards per foot. And so over five years, we've, we're seeing you know, really significant changes coming and going. Um, so that little bit really was a natural kind of shifting it back up into the dune, replacing what the storm had taken. I just want to understand this because yeah. <clears throat> I understand the, the renourishment that we did in wild dunes is hey, always make sure you the renourishment that was done in wild dunes was always thought and I've heard you guys tell say before that it's migrating down the island and, and it's accretive to the rest of the island, including what I thought I'd heard before was even the area now that we're seeing this erosion occur. So is that is now that sand for that from the uh, wild dunes now going and building up on Sullivan's Island? Is that what we're seeing? And it's bypassing the end of the island? So the sand's going to bypass naturally, regardless of whether it was nourishment sand or the native mm -hmm. beach sand. The waves are always going to be trying to move sand from Isle of Palms to Sullivan's. By nourishing, you're providing a source where it's not eroding it from your upland area and eroding it into your houses and taking that sand. We're kind of providing a bank for it to take while you're still maintaining the, the healthy beach um, along the center and north part of the island. So again, there's, I think there's plenty of sand coming to Breach Inlet, and some of it's going to be bypassing to Sullivan's Island, just like you get sand bypassing from uh, Dewey's Island to your yeah. north. Um, so that's kind of the natural flow, but the, you can still have a positive sand budget and localized erosion around these inlets because of the way the currents and the waves work. Okay. The reach five and six are where? Those, those are, are the wild dunes, dunes areas, the front beach. Oh, those are all dunes. the way up. Yes. Oh, okay. So it's not, it doesn't go. It's a reverse. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, the way I would expect south it to. to north there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do a better job in our reports of detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this just shows you the reach one, again, that, that corner of, of reach inlet, how year to year the volume change is very dynamic. It's not a consistent pattern of accretion. Even though historically that area has accreted, and that's why homes were, being, were able to be built seaward of the road that was uh, developed. Um, but over the past 10 to 15 years, it's been net uh, negative, and we have been losing some sand from that area. But there's, there's no real rhyme or reason on you know, the, the total volume. That's because it's controlled by the end of the dynamics. <laughs> So looking at what options you know, owners of the city have right now, um, there's, there's kind of two approaches. One is if there is an emergency <coughs> condition, then owners or the city, if, if it's a, a significant enough area, um, can apply for emergency permit to either scrape sand, to bring in sand from upland via truck, or to install emergency sandbags to protect their property. Um, right now we feel like there's probably two lots that may qualify for that um, and they're not adjacent to each other um, and i can't tell you exactly what addresses those are right now but the other option is a general permit measure that can be undertaken anytime it doesn't have to meet that general or that emergency condition and that you can bring trucked in sand to try to rebuild the dune um, and then the and you can also do sand fencing you know, if there is a stable beach and you're not eroding sand fencing can kind of help jump start the dune building so process. which and permit Stephen, did we did we submit the general, the general permit. permit that's what i thought <clears throat> yeah so the city has submitted an application for a general permit that would allow y'all to bring in trucked sand uh, it has to be beach compatible um and it's up to the city on whether you want to you know, do that or not what sort of timeline would that be in terms of when you start the permitting process how long would it normally take to get approval on that that one's a fairly simple one it does require a 15-day public notice period um, so once that is done um, uh, assuming there aren't any significant objections to it then it's another maybe week after that that you actually get the permit 
And you've already done that as well, right? I yes, you said the that. public comment period ends yeah. June 21st. Yeah. And how is that being paid for? Um, well, the, the permit we developed at, at the staff level, um, we need to have a conversation with city council about um, who covers the, the cost of the actual construction. Um, CSC has pulled a couple of uh, uh, cost estimates depending on the um, width of the dune that needs to be restored, and those estimates are about two hundred to three hundred thousand total. Or yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go into a couple other things that um, discuss real quick. Um, one of the um, one of the questions that I know arose last week, we were meeting with some owners, is the idea of um, possibly adjusting the uh, city's ordinance on prohibiting additional structures in the area 250 feet landward of the setback line. Um, and forgive me if I have that language a little off. But, um, this map shows that setback line and baseline. So anywhere landward of that blue line is outside of OCRM's jurisdiction. Now, I will caveat that and back up a little bit to say that where the wet beach has eroded landward of that line, so this area right here, OCRM can also claim jurisdiction over that area. Um, area that, the areas of upland landward of that point are supposedly outside of OCRM's jurisdiction, though I know some people will argue that technically that is still the beach system and, and it can get litigated. Um, right now the city has an ordinance that would prohibit owners building seawalls in that area. Uh, the state has a state policy that they don't want any sea walls built on the coast um, because they are negatively impact the beach system. Um, so the, the area between that setback line and the oceanfront structures is kind of a kind of a loophole, kind of a gray area that if the city didn't have that, an individual owner could put in a seawall. Um, in our opinion, seawalls are very good at protecting an upland private property if done in a kind of comprehensive plan where all properties in, are included and protected and it's built to a design that you know can withstand storms. But in reality, in situations like this, that's not likely to happen. It's one person puts in a seawall, the neighbor doesn't. And if that seawall ever becomes exposed, it immediately starts getting flanked. It, jeopardi it, it can cause additional erosion to the neighbors and it can also impact the public use of the beach. So in our opinion, if we're looking at kind of a, a holistic approach for the city, we, we do think that the ordinance as it is, is a good idea. Um, the taking it out and allowing owners to build individual seawalls can create a lot of problems down the road should erosion continue. Again, they do work well for protecting the upland, but um, other options owners have are the sandbags. Is kind of the sandbags are the the largest or most significant action that we think offers very good protection in temporary cases or temporary circumstances. Which brings me to kind of my final point on um, where we're at here. The core is looking at doing a beneficial use project, um, dredging sand out of the spoil islands along Breach Inlet. The ones you drive over the connector and you see that nice, beautiful sand, <laughs> they're actually trying to use that sand to do a beneficial use project. It would increase the capacity of those islands for future dredging, but it could also benefit the beach. Um, so this is a project that we're, the Corps came to us recently to get our opinion on. We thought it was a great idea. We talked to Desiree um, about supporting it. It would be 100% paid for by the core in its in its base level, um, and they could potentially add a couple of hundred thousand cubic yards to that area uh, of sand. So that could be a a very good project, and they're hoping it could be done this calendar year or early in 2024. Um, so really, if we can get if we can buy enough time to get that project put in place, uh, then I think it, this area will have a, a lot of restoration coming very soon. And Stephen, what a What's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, very good, I think. Yeah. They're, they're about a 65% design level now. They have funding identified for it. Um, the city's role really would be just as a support for them, but there may be some actions that the city could take to help pro the project uh, do a little better job in getting the beach to look like you want it. Right now, they're proposing to just kind of place the material out on the wet sand area um, because the logistics work for this material. Um, so you may want to move some of that sand up to the dune um, and that would be a cost to the city, but it'd be a very, in, in retrospect to the cost of the project in general, a very minor cost. So and Steve, how, how are you getting, you're talking about Little Goat Island, right? 
is yes. one of them. How, how, how sand getting from point A to point B if we go down this path? It would be pumped via dredge and okay. a, a line through the waterway. So not having to truck it in like the other one Correct. of the other options is, yeah. and that creates Tr trucking is a it's an impact. Yeah. Uh, even small projects or several hundred trucks worth of sand, you know, coming out onto the beach, they take a long time. Um, it does work, but it's it's not a, a great solution. Yeah. So is the option best option right now to do the uh, emergency mitigation or the general mitigation to buy us time to do this project here? Is that kind of where you're headed? Or I, I would like to give it a little time. Again, there, I understand that some owners are going to be very concerned about their current condition, but overall that area does have a, a better setback than a lot of critically eroded areas that we see up and down the coast. If, if we compare them to the eastern end of the island several years ago where you know houses are being undermined, they're, they are in a better position. However, we are going into you know, hurricane season, um, so there's, there's always that risk you take. Um, supplementing some sand, if, if the beach condition is showing signs that it's stabilizing and you see some dry sand kind of piled up along the toe of the dune, then I think you have a good chance of sand that you place, you know, maintaining itself for a little while. If, but if it's actively eroding, then if you truck in sand, it, it may not last very long at all. You, you kind of want to give nature enough time to, to settle itself out and, and see how it does before I would recommend placing a, a very large, you know, dune restoration project. You could potentially, or individual owners could potentially do smaller scale projects and kind of see how they work. So what do, what do the owners do in the meantime while they're, I mean, I'm I'm up on that beach four times a week, and it, it's continuing to erode. So I, I'm I'm just wondering, what what can we do in the meantime to stop that erosion? Again, there's there's not much you can do to stop it other than throw additional sand at it via truckload sand. Um, if it does get to the point where you know pools are getting jeopardized and sandbags, to buy enough time for this project to get in place are your um, your best solution for significant protection. You know, if there is a storm event, the sandbags will actually protect that um, a little bit better than a, a small dune would. Um, so those are localized options that you could do. And um, Stephen, and that would only be approved by the state for those properties that are within 20 feet right. of the active water yeah. line. Yeah, Your only option yeah. for any area outside of that 20 foot emergency area is trucking in some sand. Yeah, I, I, I've seen at least a couple that are probably within that right now too. But, but I, I, I mean, I was down there as well, but I, I didn't. There was no beach when I was there. I mean, I'm, I was there at high tide, and there was no beach. There's no beach. There was absolutely, you couldn't walk the beach. I mean, there's no public beach at this point. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what you're seeing. Maybe maybe I went at the wrong right, time. Right around, but, yeah, we, we but, were, it was still a little before high tide when we were out there just a yeah. little bit ago. But even at that very corner, there is no beach at high yeah. tide. But that also tells you that if you place sand right there, it's immediately going to start yeah. getting getting eroded away. Yeah. Um, Stephen, you said roughly 300 block towards a breach. Is, you're starting to see some re-nourishment, for lack of a better four. term. That, that's where it's most significant. Six, um, north of there, you still see um, you still see parts of the dune that was scraped up after Irma is still there yeah. in 2018. You, you can see where that sand still exists, mm -hmm. so they're still doing better than they had been after that storm. Still not ideal, but it is showing like, that it's healing. For um, the extensive project was done at, at Wild Dunes several years ago, uh, about 16 or 18 years ago, um, the area was, was in um, also in really bad shape, and we went through the nightmare of sandbags. Right. And uh, that's, to me, would be, uh, you're the expert, not me, but the position of last resort because... They're really bad for the environment. They break apart, and they're up and down the coast for hundreds of miles. Yeah, Ola Palms was the test case for that, and I was right. out there as they were pulling out all 13,000 of them. Um, right, yeah. And, and that started out as the small five-gallon sandbags, which were very quickly yeah, demonstrated that they didn't work. They went to the larger sandbags, which worked better, but still were not great and not maintained. The, the state has adjusted their um, criteria for sandbags to enforce them to be better maintained um, and also have a, uh, an account set up where the owners will be required to remove them. Um, they actually have to put money in to remove them. And if you remember, there was a new innovative seawall plan that would let the water in and, 
and, and bring it back out, but uh, that failed and it left sand behind. Remember that? Yes, the wave dissipation device. Yeah, yeah. That, that was shown not to be very effective at all. Um, right. And then they had to put sandbags behind them. Uh, again, sandbags are, I think, a last resort to protect you know, right. significant infrastructure. Um, uh, there are other materials and designs of sandbags that have been put in at Debidu uh, that seem to work a little better. Um, they were, they're lower, they're still one cubic yard, but they're, they're flatter and lower, so they, they seem to hold up a little better and they're different material. Um, again, it's, it, none of these are great options. Um, I don't you know, want to represent that they are. But in summary, would you reiterate what, 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 what your uh, recommendations are and what you've seen from your past experience with this? Right. I understand that, you know, the sands coming down the beach from Wild News, a lot of it's still offshore. So the sand's there, but it's just not on shore. Is that correct? Correct. And, and if if there were more of an area meeting that critical threshold, then I would recommend the city um, try to attempt a scraping project to shift that sand back up to the dune because it can be done much cheaper. Um, with the on, with only two projects or two properties, you know, two, three, four at the most probably that could meet that cr uh, criteria, you could try to do some some small scale trucking just to evaluate. You know, is this actually holding up for a couple of weeks? But I, I don't want to recommend that the city spend two hundred thousand dollars, you know, on a project that may not last. And may not. You you could focus on the most critically eroded areas right now and you know reduce that cost. Um, there's no minimum that you have to do. Um, but that would be again, if it was affecting a wider swath, then I think that might be a city-led effort. Um, if the erosion continues to get worse, then I think the city needs to be prepared to do something like that. And Stephen, what's next on the Army Corps? Um, they're going to submit to us some 65% uh, design uh, here in the next couple of weeks, I think. Um, that's about all the uh, information I have. Again, they did say this morning that they do want to, they hope to have it under construction by the end of this year, and it may bleed into early next year. Um, I said a minimum of 200,000 yards. It may be as much as four or 500,000 yards, which would be a, a great project for yeah. that whole area. Okay. I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, we've been getting uh, quite a few comments uh, from people living in this area that are really concerned about their property. And, and uh, I want to respond to them the best way we can. Um, knowing that telling them there's a project that's going to be done next year is not going to satisfy them if they're losing yards of front yard every every day and i'm afraid that we might have a situation similar to what happened at the tip of wild dunes where the homeowners took things into their own hands and actually put built their own structure and got fined and there was a whole mess about that and everything so are there things that we can suggest that would be okay for those homeowners to do if they feel like they absolutely have to do something, but it would be at their own cost. Again, any owner can, um, they, they would be able to operate under the city's general permit that y'all have applied for to truck in sand. Okay. Uh, as long as it's beach compatible and OCRM says that yes, that sand's okay. Um, okay. So that was part of the, the reasoning for the city go ahead and doing that is then they have a y'all have a permit that would cover that entire area that any owner could go and, and utilize with your permission. And that's the permit you mentioned earlier that may take another two to three weeks to get approved. Correct? It's not a year. No, it's not no. a year. Not, it's not a year. year. Yeah. Probably about another two weeks in the state. And they can they can go out and hire their own people for it. Now who monitors what they're doing to make sure that they don't just again take things in their own hands? I think Desiree does that. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I would I would suggest if that's a path that, that this will take that the city hires and has CSE um, help monitor and make sure okay. that the work is being done in accordance with the permit application, the permit conditions. Well, I, th I think we're already uh, item six. I, I would just like to make a motion that we, uh, and whilst while we're here to consult with, that we move this in the agenda and discuss it now. Yeah, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So uh, <clears throat> I think we've 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 talked about this at length, but my my, I guess part of my point, uh, problem with yours that solution is you you haven't made one homeowner doing it, then you've got three that don't, then you've got another one that does it, and really you have no you have no benefit that way, right. the way I see it, and zero benefit. 
and I don't see a way for us to get homeowners. I mean, part of what we're doing here is protecting the beach. We're not just protecting homeowners' yards. We're trying to protect the beach. Uh, as I said, you know, I'm seeing continual erosion. There's points in that we don't have a public beach anymore. And, and in some degree, I don't see how we can expect private homeowners to pay to restore a public beach. So my, my, my recommendation is, is that we get you to put together a design of how we can mitigate this until we can get this project put in place and try to expedite the, the bigger project. But that we, you know, if it takes $200,000 to put in and rebuild a dune, that we, we find a way to do that in the city does it and does it in a way that maximizes the potential that it lasts until we can get the larger project because I think if we leave it to homeowners you know some of them are going to build you know some of them see their you know and we've gotten numerous emails that you know they're watching their yards literally wash away every day <laughs> and they're going to do things to stop it and then there's going to be litigation and then there's going to be all kind of other things that happen and my proposal is is that the city you know that's what partly where we do a beach nourishment fund and we have funding there is that we put in some temporary the best thing we can do to stop this erosion from occurring preserve the beach and expedite this stronger project in this project being the Army Corps? The Army Corps. I think this is a great yeah. solution to it. Um, I think we want to do everything possible to expedite it so that we're ready to go as soon as practically possible. But I think we need some interim solution in place right now that stops what we see occurring down there on, on that end of the island. I, I agree with, with that, um, what uh, Councilperson Bogosian said. What I'm just thinking of is just in case somebody decides to <coughs> jump the gun down there without uh, that we have an idea in place that is possible if a homeowner wants to step forward and just uh, purchase their own sand for the front of their house. Well, if we've got a if we've got an approval come or I guess the 21st is the deadline for the uh, public comment, and a week yeah. later we can get a permit. I mean, I think it sounds to me like by the first week of July, if we went forward with a, we could bring this up any time, but uh, go forward with a project, we could start right away. Well, and that just, that depends on the availability of a contractor yeah. as well. Yeah, and you'd also have to coordinate with the local turtle team to ensure yeah. that there were no nests yeah. between the. There's know, there's one the nest at 622. I talked to uh, the head of the turtle team, and and uh, she's in support of. I mean, they seem to be in support of a. Uh, mitigation yeah and, and again from the engineering perspective we're always happy to have more sand on the beach um, there but there's nothing we can do to stop the erosion so if we place it there you know I just can't guarantee you that that dune won't you know will still be there two weeks later in the areas that are actively eroding um, so again you may want to start as a smaller project in those areas uh, and see how that holds up and if it looks yeah. like it's holding up where your investments you know paying off then we can expand out that that is the good thing about trucking projects is they're very you know personal you yeah know, you can kind of tweak well, i don't think anybody would be in favor of you putting sand in there today and then next week it's gone <laughs> i think we have to be smart about what we do and 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 try to engineer it so a way that it, like i said it has the the best chance of survival for the next six nine months um, and if we see things shift, then we can always bring more, you know, bring more sand in. But I, I do think doing nothing is what's causing homeowners to start talking about, you know, taking matters in their own hand because they, they don't see any kind of a plan that stops their yards from going out to sea. Yeah, the longest range plan we also are looking at um, certainly including all of that area south of the pier in the next permit for an offshore project. Um, we did that in the last project, but the beach condition was fairly healthy at that time, and there wasn't funding identified for that south end. Uh, for this time, I think we're going to try to, um, you know, with council's approval, uh, find a borrow area closer to that south end that would make the economics of nourishing that area a lot better, um, and, and including that in a potential nourishment project if the erosion continues. And that would be, again, above and beyond the Army Corps project longer yes, term? Yes, that, that would be kind of in conjunction with uh, another project at the east end you know whenever that time comes we're trying to get out way ahead of uh, this upcoming project so is it too much to ask that before the council you know by the council meeting we come back and have a sort of a plan 
presented on what the mitigation could be and the timing of that, all that past the 21st. Yeah, Stephen, before you answer, that's two weeks from tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah th those plans are very easy to do. We would, um, we can present, I'll send Desiree kind of a map of the areas that we feel are um, the most crit critically eroded. I again, it seems like somewhere right around Third Avenue is a transition zone between actively eroding and, and no dry sand beach at all. Um, so we would probably focus on that area and come up with a quantity um, that could be placed there. And I, again, I think maybe working as a, a, a phased approach or a staggered approach and, and seeing maybe a, give it two weeks to give one area two weeks to kind of evolve. And then before we commit to doing a, a fuller project, maybe a, a way That's to go. A plan. And Stephen, are you, you said you haven't done the measurements and look for this year for us like you do every year. I mean, could, could you mind change in two weeks if you go out and measure and there's some that are 15 feet, you know, from the critical line? I mean, that would be part of the conversation. Right, and, and as soon as there was, you know, a dozen properties or more meeting that um, emergency condition, yeah. we would, I would recommend going to the state. I've already kind of discussed that, that, you know, let's scrape a dune because that does work yeah. in areas where you have a wide profile. Again, it's not that you have a critically eroding profile. It's just the way the shape changes around these inlets um, so there is sand that you could scrape and that's a much cheaper quicker kind of cleaner project uh, to do um, but you just can't you don't have that option right now and we've so we're, we've submitted for the general permit for the emergency is that a separate permit it would be a separate permit but it's a quicker permit gotcha um, and not one you can do until you've met the 20 foot threshold correct correct okay Desiree. So we'll plan on um, having a proposal from CSC for you all to consider at the 26th, uh, June 27th meeting. By then, the public comment period had been ended. We would have an idea of how much time the state would need before granting a permit, understand what conditions they're going to add to the permit because we're in turtle nesting season, um, and be able to, to execute a, a plan at that time. Let me ask you something too, Desiree, regarding funding, a related project, a uh, related topic on this. It's my understanding that the, the state has pulled um, any beach nourishment funding out of the budget. And to me, that's a problem that we don't get, you know, if these are public beaches, um, then the public needs to help pay for them. You know, it shouldn't be the aisle pump taxpayers or, or tax money that's going solely for the beach beach nourishment. And I think that's something we need to take up with um, with some of our representatives and our lobbyists to make sure that we we, we get our voices heard there. You know, everybody wants to come to the beach, but nobody and, and and everybody thinks that the state pays for it through their tax money. Well, they're not paying for it. And I think it's something we need to push pretty heavy uh, with our lobbyists and our representatives. Yeah, and John, remember what Senator Campson had put in an ongoing funding mechanism for beach renourishment, yeah. which you know the coastal communities were certainly in favor of, uh, and that that's what's got pulled Pull out. So yeah. it's, you know they're, they've continued to do the same thing they've always done. It's just a one-time dump of money in for beach renourishment that mm -hmm. you can't count on because right. we're not ready to do a big beach renourishment we're going to do a permit this year to have it for five years ahead but i hear you i completely yeah. agree and just for the record i know some of you have asked this before <coughs> in terms of how much money the city has in the beach preservation fee fund um, as a reminder that fund um, or that one percent to uh, in accommodations tax revenue was adopted in 2015 since then it has uh, generated at, uh, to date seven seven and a half million dollars and it generates about a million a million five in FY 22 as y'all recall we had um, an unprecedented uh, uh, revenues and from tourism tourism revenue and um, that fund generated 1.8 so just so that you have an idea how much that fund collects every year and again it's one percent on heads and beds people who stay overnight yeah, that was yeah. Um, Mike Satili when he was in the state house. He got that pushed through. He was yeah, a big, good. big that, advocate for that it. That fund balance is what about nine, eight, nine million. Right? Seven, Seven point five. five. Okay. And that's why this is such a great project, though, the, because it's you know, it's, it's very cost effective. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, just just real quickly. Uh, historically, it's always been considered that a homeowner on the beach owns to the mean high tide mark. That's their property. Um, is that correct? Generally, yes. Sometimes, not always. Um, if there's 
other like things grants and things can be a little different but generally yes yeah, to the, yeah. Uh, I mean, okay uh, yeah so um, so that's that's been that's been sort of a generally accepted thing yeah. that you own to the mean high tide mark yeah. what the happens when you line though is also up for debate on what that actually means <laughs> um, it, well I, I get it yeah, yeah. Uh, but what does that mean when you do have the sea encroaching on what would be considered private property Anywhere uh, what what make what makes the where does the ownership begin and end with the uh, and the responsibility for renourishment with that homeowner as the sea encroaches on what would be, be, be considered typically their private property yeah. um, that's that a clear? good question for an attorney um, because <laughs> yeah. I, I have that question well I don't mean to put you on a legal yeah. spot I'm just, um, yeah. but generally anywhere seaward of the um, vegetation line is part of the state trust so any person can go on that. So if the beach erodes back into somebody's yard, um, somebody can walk on that wet sand beach. Mm -hmm. um, if the beach accretes back, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. It's a question that comes up. Um, there's been attorney general's opinions on that, on does that become state property or does it refer back to the homeowner? Uh, I still think it, it hasn't been fully clear yet on, mm -hmm. on what that means. Um, the the issue on um, who's responsible for maintaining a beach it's I, I don't think there is an answer to that it's individuals can take ownership of their properties and say that this is my investment and I'm going to do what it takes to protect that and so some of the private communities that's kind of their approach is you know their house is their investment and if they have to spend you know X amount of dollars a year to protect that and maintain their property values they do that themselves um, but it needs to be done on a community-wide basis because individuals can't maintain a beach by themselves. It has to be a, you know, a stretch. Um, other communities, this, the towns, you know, are completely 100% responsible for it. They take that ownership and responsibility, and it takes it out of the owner's hands. But then the owners sometimes are left with, you know, situations where they may have a house that's critically eroding for two or three years while a town you know, builds funds or gets a permit or whatever it may be. You answered that like an attorney <laughs> <laughs> or an economist I've heard it a couple on the times. one hand on the other hand Stephen and Patrick thank you guys for all yeah, thank over you. the years and this help so appreciate that Absolutely. And Desiree you're good yes Douglas. sir okay all right and we'll go to the dashboard next item is dashboard of city operations Desiree I'll let you walk through some of this all right um, the slide on the screen is updated from the one in your packet just when you look at the fire department calls by type and i'll i'll talk you through that but you can see it you can see the updated uh, numbers on the screen um, i'll go ahead and start with personnel vacancies um, we have a building licensing clerk opening in our building department um, looking for nine bso's as you all recall we increased the budget amount so that we can hire more that could be dedicated uh, to the beach and to parking um, in excess of what we've had in the in the past um, we still have a code enforcement officer position in the police department we had um, made an offer to an individual who um, has since then withdrawn from consideration so unfortunately we're back to square one um, we might have some leads of folks that may be interested and may be good at that that we'll be pursuing but unfortunately um, we were expecting that position to to start, uh, I believe, this week or next week, and, and that is not that is not happening. Um, uh, and the other um, the other uh, vacancy that we have is, is in the public works department. We have one city L driver position. Um, also, wanted to publicly announce that our uh, new finance director will be starting um, in a couple of weeks. Um, she'll be working alongside Debbie for um, some time to work on the transition, but I'm happy that we... Six or seven months, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. Don't push it. <laughs> um, but we're excited to get that process um, completed and excited to have um, Ms. Hamilton join our team. A couple of things that I wanted to highlight here. We'll talk more in detail uh, at a, uh, under livability uh, regarding short-term rentals but i um, just wanted to show you all um what we've what we've collected for the year um police department charges are trending um higher than in past years uh, with the exception of parking citations that is still um, year to date trending behind the last two years and that, again that's something that we're hoping to improve upon 
by hiring additional personnel and um, ideally outsource that, that operation for next year. Um, municipal court docket, the number of cases. Last month, you all um, approved an associate judge so that uh, we can have more um, additional uh, municipal courts throughout the month. You can see how that the number of cases have um, increased significantly year over year, um, which shows it's a direct correlation to our enforcement efforts from from the police department. Fire department calls by type. Um, here we made a, this is the correction that we made from the version that you have in your packet, and it's not a correction; it's just an explanation. We've been talking about. Uh, year-to-date numbers for 2023 include automatic aid calls um, of the um, 571 calls um, were auto aid 33 percent were auto aid um, of those 167 were canceled on route and um, 20 were actually attended by our fire department personnel in Mount Pleasant um, 65 calls in IOP were supported by Mount Pleasant um, Fire Department. Um, just so that we have an apples to apples comparison, I had requested the chief to see if we can get numbers from Mount Pleasant about the number of calls they're dispatched and council in route so that we have a comparison um, to see at the end of the year when we will review this uh, pilot program for, for automatic aid. Um, Public garbage, uh, uh, public works garbage and, y and yard debris trending a little bit up uh, compared to, to, to May uh, um, for the past two years. Recreation department registrations a little bit um, trending down year over year, but um, up for, for the month of May, um, which I think it's a great sign. And then the only other thing I wanted to highlight was just the community events that we have coming up. The farmer's market is coming back starting this month, third Thurs third Thursday of uh, of June through through October, and that's going to be at the Recreation Center. Also, a community overdose prevention and Narcan training. That's something that the fire department is going to be offering. It was a request from our Front Beach uh, restaurant owners, wanting to make sure that their staff are um, trained in the administration of Narcan. Um, the mayor has his coffee with the mayor event every month, and that will be held at City Hall in June uh, June 30. And then the IOP Beach run is July 29th. Quick question. I have one request. Hang on, Jan. Okay. Jimmy. Uh, just a question about um, police report, uh, two, well, three quick questions. Animal violations, so uh, year to date was 30. Last year, year to date was two. What, what's the big increase there? And also- Dogs. But, and also, business license year to date is 28. Last year it was one. And also, the only other one I have a question about is the noise violation year to date for the whole island is two. So, you, I think you're looking at the livability report? Yeah. Yes. Um, so, that's. It's a monthly, well, it, maybe it's livability, yeah. but it just has everything on it. From We're going to get. Let's defer that conversation for just three minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll finish the dashboard and then we're going to go. I got one back. comment on this, Desiree. I think that on that short term rental uh, license, it says five months for 23. I think that should be one month. One? It's, it's a calendar so, year. Not yeah, it's the, the license year. So the yeah. license year, you're right, it would it be, be two, month. two, two months um, since right. May 1st, May and, May and June. Okay. This is through June or through May? It's one month. It's one month. It's one month. Process. You're correct. Yeah. Would, would it be too much to just relabel that or put it in another box? Because it, there has been a lot of confusion as to the uh, time periods that are being compared. And I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but I don't think anybody or too many people in the public know what a license year is. So I think we should be real clear when we're counting um, that, you know, this, those metrics above are definitely a five month period. Uh, but this metric is not the calendar year or the license year runs from May to April. So I think we ought to we ought to be clear and, and break that out differently. Yeah, the reports that we're going to discuss on short-term rentals specifically, we did include the license year yeah. so that folks understand yeah. what we're, when we say 2022 what it means in 2023. Jan. But yeah, we can make those adjustments. Sorry. Thanks, Jan. I just have one more suggestion in talking about automatic aid. Automatic aid should be reported both ways. 
calls for us to aid other municipalities and calls from us requesting automatic aid. It would be nice to see how, what reciprocal we're getting from that. So the, the, the calls are not requested. That's why it's, it's automatic. So as soon as a yeah. call is made, okay. Um, when the department receives a call, they make an assessment of, of, of the type of call and what resources they need. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, that's why you see that number of the number of calls that were canceled en route. We're automatically dispatched, and then the department directly dis uh, says, you know, uh, cancel, don't, don't come to us. We, we got it, essentially. Um, we've, we've noted that. So 187 are those that were canceled uh, from us to Mount Pleasant, yes, we do not know how many calls were canceled the other way around, which I, we were requested that information. Hopefully, we have that for next month. Yeah. Okay. So you'll get that for us next month. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's what I'll. That's all I have. Okay. And we want to hit the livability report and the police. That's some new information. Yes, we have the monthly report for every department, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things, make sure that, you're, um, that, that you and the public are looking at it. Um, there's a new livability report, and I'm, I'm going to ask the chief to come up and discuss that in a little bit of detail. We're doing it uh, differently than we have done it in the past, a lot more information here. Um, and we've made some adjustments over the past couple of months based on feedback we've received from council and from community members. I also wanted to highlight there is a new um, rec, uh, uh, report, monthly report from the Recreation Department, a little bit different than what you have seen in the past. I think it's a, uh, a great addition. If you have any specific questions of data or um, visuals that you would like to see, a uh, month over time, let us know. We'll, we'll adjust that. I think that it's a, it's a great direction and, and, and work that, that the department has done, and I just want to highlight that. I agree. I, I compliment you for the new report. I, it's really, really informative and great. Yeah, very well Good done. Good job. And the other thing I wanted to point out is the public work stormwater management um, report shows a lot of the efforts, in-house maintenance um, efforts that we have been doing on stormwater management. And that's something unique that we have we started doing recently with the purchase of equipment that, that allows us to, to be more proactive in maintaining um, ditches and drains and all that. So I just wanted to alert you to that. And, and if you want to spend some time looking at that, um, I think it would be um, it will show you that that we're taking very seriously the city's um, priority of managing and maintaining drainage and ensuring that. Um, we have a, a, a well-run uh, stormwater management plan. Yeah. It was significant for the month. Robert and Linton, thank you guys right. for doing yes, that. Yes, they've been busy. Very Chief, thorough. Chief, you want to touch on this? You don't want to hear about this hammerdillo. <laughs> <laughs> out there. I'm not sure what happened with the armadillo. <laughs> Finally caught the cat. Uh, yeah, they jump. So they do jump. <laughs> Can I ask how your BSO is doing? Uh, he is doing well. I talked to him on Sunday, uh, and I do want to take a minute to brag on him. Yeah, Chief, give a little background because not everybody's up to speed on so that. So on Sunday, one of our BSOs were um, doing parking enforcement. They wrote an individual a ticket for four feet off pavement, and that individual showed up shortly after the ticket, confronted the officer, demanded that the officer the BSO uh, void the ticket out and the BSO said no. Uh, it was a clear violation and the individual stood in front of the vehicle trying to keep him from leaving and it, the BSO tried to leave anyways and as he did, uh, the individual who is twice the size of the BSO uh, struck him in the face uh, with a closed fist uh, and then got in his vehicle and fled the scene. But I, I have to brag that that is not something our BSOs come into this job uh, expecting to get. You know, it, Police officers don't expect it, but we know it's kind of, it might happen. Uh, but BSOs do not expect it or think it might happen to them. And he was uh, very sharp and quickly used his radio to hit the emergency button, get the full function of the radio, and was able to get the information out that he was assaulted, the vehicle information, the tag, get it all out. Our communication specialist was able to use our cameras on the on Palm Boulevard to say, hey, that vehicle's going towards Sullivan's Island. Uh, in Sullivan's Island and Mount Pleasant were able to get their officers out in the route that they might travel and Mount Pleasant found the vehicle, stopped the vehicle, 
Uh, we went over and took custody of the uh, individual that was driving and put him in jail for punching our BSO uh, because that is not acceptable. <laughs> uh, but the BSO, when I talked to him, uh, he is a young gentleman and uh, was very, very nice when I talked to him. <laughs> he was laughing and said, you know, I'm going to have a cool story to say <laughs> and a bruise. <laughs> but he's doing well. Thank you for asking. Glad to hear. Glad to hear. I was very impressed with him. He, that was going to throw most people off, and he, did, he handled it like a champ, like a true professional. Uh, in reference to the uh, reports here, uh, as Ms. Fergoso pointed out earlier, these are new reports that we just started doing this year. And as we continue to go through them and we get information, we're going to be fine-tuning them. And I realize that this one is slightly different than some that we did in the past. In the past, we had three different breakouts of what noise looks like. And at the end of the day, a noise violation is a noise violation is a noise violation. It doesn't matter which kind it is. And so to simplify it and keep from having questions that were coming up, we reduced that down to one noise section on here uh, just to keep it easy. And you'll see next month some of this might change. Uh, like dog at large, I appreciate that our code enforcement officer helps our our animal control officer to catch dogs at large, but that's not really a livability part. And so I, we're going to remove that from the livability report as well. It'll go into the animal control section, helping out with that, but not tracked under, under livability unless it is a call pertaining to a dog at large that specifically relates to a short-term rental or livability issue. And you'll also see next month we will add where it says short-term rental occupancy violations on this. Uh, you see it over here. Yep. That was confusing, so it will say other short-term rental occupancy violations. So uh, any of those, or I'm sorry, the one above it, rental property violations, that will say other. Anything that's not outlined on here will fall into that category. Uh, the, does that make sense? Yep. And, mm -hmm. and then we will add a bar graph for you next next month. Uh, I love graphs. I love visuals. They're, they're great to follow. I'm a, I'm, I was an infantry soldier once, so <laughs> crowns and pictures are great. Uh, but bar graph that will give you a year-to-day snapshot of where we look by charge or by complaint type and it will outline the type of complaints just like you see here except year-to-date and then warnings and citations that were issued for those different uh, types of violations or calls that came in going back to councilman ward's question on the front it, what you see under charges where it says two that would mean that we made two charges for okay. noise violations as this opposed year. to What's a year? Correct. Yeah. So one of them will be for the month of May, and the other one would have been for another month Previous. prior to that. I think it's uh, a good stat that you have about the, uh, especially recently, in roll cart violations. And I don't know about other people, but I've been getting a lot of calls, and it sounds like there's a lot more, but it turns out to be there's only been six citations issued. And I talked with Desiree today, and she said that the policy with the officer is that he always gives a warning first and then so that's why the warnings are 58 and so the total is 64 but only six citations were issued that's correct he goes out of his way when it comes to the rural cart violations to uh, because it's something that's been on the books that we haven't necessarily enforced and so he went out of his way to give an exorbitant amount of time to become compliant uh, and i will tell you we did our beach emergency vehicle operation training this morning down on 45th Avenue area and when I drove up Palm Boulevard there were two recycle bins that was it everything else was off the street it was clean it was pretty and that is a result of the work that he's done with those roll carts and the, the fact that he could do that and we only had six tickets issued I think that's a huge success and a huge win for for code enforcement John yeah I, I would like to compliment um, Sergeant Kowski, Jace, he, he's done, I, and I've told him this a couple of times, I've had interactions with him, but I think he's doing a remarkable job with it. And I've noticed the difference, and I think residents has noticed the difference with what he's done. It's important that we fill the other one, though, and he even <laughs> says that. Uh, there's a lot more work to do, but I, I, I do think that he's, he's doing a good job. My question, though, is on the unfounded noise complaints, and are we looking at those and as a kind of a, continuous loop and training and, and uh, uh, the officers that why they were unfounded, were they really unfounded? I mean, if somebody's going to call on a noise complaint, um, the threshold today is, you know, as a reasonable person feel it's, it's, it, it's, 
it's noise. <laughs> and, uh, and and I don't know if we're looking back at those and kind of doing a self reflection on were they really unfounded or not, and who's doing that. So we do the the officers have to complete a form and it explains why it's unfounded. And a lot of times these unfounded might have been that when the caller called it in, there was noise. But when the officers arrived, there was no noise. And so mm -hmm. to that, that's unfounded. The officer got there, there was no noise. Some of it may be that a call came in, uh, and I've, I've heard this one recently about kids, uh, just today, kids in a pool. Um, and when an officer shows up, if kids are playing in a pool, that's not an, an, an excessive noise. And so that would be listed as yeah. an unfounded, unless they were partying. And uh, But we were talking about a four and five year old kid. They, they clearly were not throwing a party. So that would be listed as an unfounded. Okay. But we do, we, yes sir, we track them and we yeah. check them to make sure. Uh, yeah. Because if it's something that should have been founded, um, sometimes if we're kind of hesitant, we'll look at their body camera to go back and review whether it was founded or unfounded. Uh, and then that's a good teaching moment for us to use with the new officers to make sure that they're understanding what we're looking for. Scott. Chief, uh, just to shift gears on you, can you go to your other report where it shows your charges and other, um, I just want to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly as well. I think it's back of you. Be the first page. It's right after the dashboard, yeah. One more. There you go. Um, Am I reading that right? It looks like the May uh, this year and the year to date are are exceeding by quite a bit uh, the trending in last year on what I would consider maybe some of the other more severe charges of other in that category. Is there anything driving that volume or am I reading that correctly or it just seems like we're running a lot higher or there's we, a lot more activity, enforcement, et cetera? I think a little bit of all of the above. It, it has been, the Chief Oliveris and I were talking about this before we came in here, this year so far has seemed to be busier for us uh, and even today the calls were coming in consistent uh, and uh, our officers were, were working hard so there's a little bit of the officers are getting more calls and these officers are being very proactive in some of the things like yeah, i'm not sure exactly what charge you were looking well, at. i'm just like i mean i'm looking at the bottom it looks like we're about running about 50 percent higher year to date when i look at the 620 uh, yeah, 628 versus 915 total charges in all these categories. Looks like we're running a lot, uh, a lot higher. That is correct, and some of that comes to the when you look at driving under suspension, for example, uh, that's double what it was last year, and those charges are going to be coming from traffic enforcement. The increased enforcement of traffic violations typically will lead to more, not only traffic-related tickets, but that's when we're finding maybe illegal narcotics or firearms or something like that that they shouldn't have or even the driving under suspension um, or the uh, DUIs uh, and even golf carts. I mean, the numbers are small, but when you compare it to last year, the, I think that enforcement is it's showing that we have made a change in our approach to it and we are being more specific and actually focusing hard on these things uh, this year. And that, that's all going to drive a part of it to include the increased calls for service. I, I, I also want to add to Chief 2020, 2021, and for part of 2022, we were not fully staffed in the police department. At one point, we had a seven, eight vacancies. We're fully staffed now, um, which I think is reflective too in, in, in a lot of the bandwidth that you're able to, um, to do every month. I would so. definitely agree with that. Right now, we have one officer that is in field training, meaning that he is not a solo officer yet. Uh, hopefully, if, if things go right, Tuesday, he will move, be blessed off and move on. And then we have one more that is going through the pre-academy. Uh, and then we will have <coughs> one vacancy show up in next month uh, that we'll be working to fill. So Jim, in some cases, yeah. oh, Look, this is uh, good information. I hate to drag this out, but could you um, give a little more detail on business license? Um, compared as 28 year to date compared to one last year. Do you have a new officer or something? In that? No, sir, that falls under code enforcement Kowski as well. He, uh, when we first created that code enforcement, that was really our gear was, was looking at those business license and, and targeting those that were coming on the weekends that thought they could just find the loop and work when uh, mm -hmm. city hall was closed uh, and officer Cal a lot of that's contractors correct yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes sir. he's he's done a phenomenal okay, job some good. of those will be short-term rentals too right that didn't have a license that he did cite very good thank you very much okay i was just going to say it does sound like a lot of this is 
possibly that we're doing a better, y'all are doing a better job or you have more people to be doing the job than it is the fact that like our crime is actually going up. Is that a, a more positive way of looking at it? <laughs> it is a Finally. positive way and, and, and it, it is right. It is twofold. Uh, the officers are doing a fantastic job and it's great when you see the morale increase uh, when from one it, it kind of spreads and then you see more enforcement opportunities. It, it, I would point out we do have more calls for service and nationwide we we have seen an increase in crimes uh, but I think overall we're doing well and the fact that we are so proactive with traffic enforcement and these other things they are saving us from those stats that we would get for property crimes and those other violent type crimes because we're able to stop it before it happens and, and arrest people most of the time. I got a parking ticket the other day so keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Desiree, anything else? No, sir. All right, Chief, thank you. My pleasure. As thank always. You. Just, you might as well sit right there. You might as well sit right there. You know how this works. <laughs> All right, next item under item six, strategic plan policy initiatives and priorities. A, livability. One, discussion of recommendation from the Public Safety Committee to defer action on a new noise ordinance until the city receives noise. Study report from Wild Dunes Resort and to consider hiring a noise consultant and or city planner to advise the city on noise policy. You recall we passed first reading last month, goes back to committee as per usual. See what the committee is recommending. Jimmy or Desiree, anything to add? Mr. The uh, Mr. committee, the committee uh, recommended exactly what is stated. Okay. And uh, it, it, the vote was three to zero. Right. Jan. Um, I just had an additional comment that I wanted to make, uh, a statement that I'd like to read. I was recently requested by a resident to recuse myself from participating in deliberations on the noise ordinance concerning the Wild Dunes Resort because of a conflict of interest with the proposed MLK reception to be hosted by the City of Isle Palms and occurring at Sweetgrass Inn. I have acted as a facilitator among the various parties, specifically the YWCA of Greater Charleston, the event sponsor, and the resort. Since I have not and will not have any financial gain from the interaction, it is my understanding that there is no conflict of interest for me. The Wild Dunes Community Association, on whose board my husband sits, has no financial or other interest in the MLK reception. Our city attorney has stated that there is no conflict of interest for me, but the demand was made again. So I am taking the step of requesting an opinion from the South Carolina Ethics Commission and expect to hear from them by June 15th this week. In the meantime, I will continue to perform my civic duties until told otherwise by a reliable authority. If there is a perceived conflict of interest for any action related to where I live, then for every decision we make concerning the Isle of Palms, all of council would be in, in conflict since we all are affected by our decisions and we would be unable to do our job. Uh, the relevant section, I'm not going to read it tonight, but the relevant section to the state code that I'm referring to is the Ethics Act, South Carolina Code, Section 8-13-700. Thank you. Desiree, anything on the noise ordinance from your view need to add or change? No, sir. Um, I am in the process of trying to secure some proposals from folks that have um, assisted other communities in advising on their noise um, ordinances. Um, as I reported to the Public Safety Committee last week or the week before, um, not a whole lot of them out there. And those that are and do this type of work are really busy. Um, so I don't know how quickly we can get some assistance to work on this. Um, I know that we are expecting a summer report from Wild Dunes. They've conducted their own analysis and are sharing a summary with the city. Um, I, again, don't know what that will entail. In the meantime, Chief Gornett and I have discussed an effort at, um, at random times throughout the summer, be able to utilize our resources that are on the island to take some meet, some readings. We, ha we did that um, uh, last year when we started talking about a, uh, changes to the noise ordinance to include some decibel, um, uh, sort of establishing objectives uh, and decibel um, limits dependent by zone. So we can continue that effort. It will not be uh, very scientific, potentially. There will at least be data <laughs> But points. at least some data points that we can point to. Um, and, and we've obviously identified uh, several areas, not only 
Front Beach and, and the area uh, around the resort, but also in our community to try to identify, um, um, to have some more data regarding the decibels and, 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 and what, the, what the real issue that we may be trying to solve by proposing a new noise ordinance. So we can do that through in, in the meantime, and as soon as I am able to secure a proposal from uh, whether it's a city planner or a consultant firm, um, we'll, we'll bring that before you all um, for consideration. John. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to watch the public safety committee meeting, so I, maybe this was covered in there, maybe it wasn't, I, I'm not sure, but one of the questions I have is, and, and it's different from reads in here, but I, you said a summary, we're gonna receive a summary report. I, I don't know why we wouldn't receive the full report if there's data in there that we would look at and want to analyze and look at. I mean, I, I would think we'd want to get the full report uh, if it's available. So uh, that is that is up to yeah, of course. the private well, organization well, yeah. and- I understand that, but I just don't know why you just provide a summary, you just give us the report and let us, you know, that includes the summary. Um, and then I, I guess this, uh, you know, I have an opinion, I, uh, you know, I'll, I don't know what at this point uh, Mother Noe's uh, consultant is going to tell us. I mean, we've used about, you know, a dozen different cities um, as, a, as a guideline. There's noise ordinances. They've all, I'm sure some of them have used noise engineers. Our noise is not any different than somebody else's city's noise. And I think we can, I think we're kind of in uh, analysis paralysis here of this thing. And I mean, I'm willing to hold off and get the uh, Wild Dunes report, but at some point we're going to have to either make a decision whether we want a new noise ordinance or we don't <laughs> drop it. And this thing has been going on way too long, uh, in my opinion. Totally agree. I mean, it seems like we're the first city that's ever tried to put in a noise ordinance, and I don't think we are. So um, I do feel like we are reinventing the wheel here. But, and I would also like to understand why we can't just be provided a report. Um, it, I don't I can't imagine that there's anything confidential um, in a noise report. So, if I may say something. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's their report. They paid for it. <laughs> they can disclose whatever they wish. Um, this is, you know, we're not voting on it tonight. This is just a, the the motion was to recommend to, to postpone this. Um, we recommend to full council. Now, when it comes to full council on the 27th, if you don't like it, then you can vote against the recommendation and vote for the noise ordinance. That's simple as that. Desiree, anything else? No, sir. All right, next item, discussion of ordinance 2023-02 to regulate e-bikes and battery-assisted motorized skateboards on the beach. Again, this was passed first reading at our last month's meeting, referred back to the Public Safety Committee after review. I understand there's no changes recommended from the committee at this point. No, Jenny, I just uh, have one question for the police chief, if I may. Absolutely, far away. Thank you, sir. Um, how many complaints are you having about this? Have you had um, a lot or a little bit or has it seemed to increase just recently? What's, what's the trend between now and last year this time? So I think since e-bikes really started to become a thing, we've had a, a few complaints, not a lot, that would come in each summer. It's typically around the time when the beaches are busiest. Right. Uh, but it's not, I wouldn't say it, it compares, when I do my priority of complaints, it is very low on the on the totem pole because we just don't get as many right so not a lot we we have had several here recently though yeah i think there's been a lot of activity recently that's correct you know there's things things, there things kind of flash up and yes, you know sir. fade away it's kind of like breach inlet it's been and, the tides have been going since i think uh general cornwall has had a hard time there <laughs> a couple of centuries ago because it's very dynamic but um so i was just wondering uh, but to this point, um, you haven't heard of uh, any injuries or anything? No, sir. There's not. Okay. I am not aware of any incidents where somebody's been hurt. Yeah. I got a couple of complaints from today that I would log if you need okay. some data. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, just a couple of items. One, I'm not clear. I thought when we first started talking about this, we were looking at a, um, you know, we either ban them or not ban them. And it looks like now there has been a change. It looks like we're doing a 10 to 5 uh, and, and on a calendar time. 
Um, I can just tell you from experience, and, and I think when these e-bikes first started coming out, they were for pedal assist, and now they're uh, basically electronic. Full speed. Um, full speed ahead, 40 miles an hour, and um, again, I, I see them on the beach a lot more frequently than I did just five years ago. I'm a fan of e-bikes. I've used them before. They're great, but they're becoming, um, they're, they're basically electric, you know, low-end motorcycles on, in many cases, and I've seen some quite powerful ones out on the beach. So I don't know what's changed. I think I think that the uh, you know the ordinance that we're looking at I think was kind of an exception in North Myrtle Beach where they're using it. But most municipalities they either ban them or they don't ban them. Um, and I don't know. And one one more thing is that early on on a Sunday morning uh, running at the beach, we see the uh, lot at the county filling up by 10 o'clock. So the whole front beach is full. Um, I don't. I don't think 10 o'clock is a is a is a good time. I think we ought to at minimum uh, broaden that if we're going to be even considering a time frame from you know nine to six or what have you. Um, but I think we got to decide whether or not we want to take the risk of the uh, growing population of the e-bikes uh, and the horsepower on the beach, and the growing population of the people on the beach, and whether or not we want these motorized vehicles running up and down the beach for the risk of hitting somebody. Yeah. I actually started looking into this um, a lot more in the last couple of weeks after I was driving my car and was almost hit twice by an individual on an e-bike. <laughs> so I started doing some research and looking into the instances of injuries um, going up astronomically. Um, children, there are absolutely no regulations whatsoever on children. Um, I was also almost hit by one on the walkway in Wild Dunes. Um, I'm not sure if they're allowed to be on that walkway or not, but that's neither here nor there, kind of. Um, they're not. <laughs> but, and then also, having ridden a bike very recently on Front Beach, just a regular bike, I can tell you I was probably going, you know, as slow as you can pretty much go on a bike, and it was almost impossible. Um, so, I, and these, they can they typically are sold to go between 25 and 30 miles an hour however you can very easily go on google and find a way to hack them to make them go even faster um so i yeah, definitely i i think we i actually think we need to look into restrictions for them not just on the beach but i really think we need to to watch out on the beach also if you add in the fact that if they're going with the wind um, they could be going, I can't even imagine how fast. <laughs> and they weigh between 50 and 80 pounds, whereas a regular bike, you yeah. know, probably weighs 10 pounds. They're a lot of fun, but they're going to be dangerous. On yeah, the and again, yeah. to Jimmy's point on the early one, we've got a second reading coming up. You want to make changes and edits? <laughs> that's the time to do it at council meeting. Yeah, one question. Uh, you, you talked about the complaints have gone up, so... Yes. So what have been the nature of those complaints? Have they been on the beach, on the street, both? And, 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 and the type of complaints, is it because they're simply there on the beach, or is it because they're actually interfering with a group on the beach, almost hitting them? Can you tell us a little more about that, Chief? Yes, sir. I, I've only heard of the recent complaint um, that was not on the beach, and that was uh, the juveniles riding the electric bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, but aside from that, the ones on the beach are typically called in uh, because people are concerned about the speed at which they're being operated while there are children running towards the beach. Uh, and I would say when, when we operate on the beach, our policy, even for emergency response with our ATVs and our side-by-sides, is that we go 15 miles an hour. We don't want to go faster than that on an ATV because I don't want to hurt somebody. Uh, and these bikes, we do have two e-bikes as well in the police department that we use, and they, they, they exceed that limit pretty easily on the beach. And that's where the complaints are coming in. Just the speed during the times when there are kids that are running back and forth okay. are the complaints I've taken. Thanks. You have one final note, if I may. The, the thing about we, we need to understand, the kids are running perpendicular to where the e-bikes are going. And as we all know, kids get excited. They're not really looking right and left. They don't see a street to cross. They see the beach. They see the water. And so um, they're not really paying attention to what's coming from their right or their left. I can see where that's a problem, don't you? Yes, sir. That, that's, that would that's certainly right. be the concern. Yeah. Thank you. Jan. 
Uh, just briefly, as a traffic engineer, motorized vehicles and pedestrians usually don't do well together. So we try to separate them out. And I think putting the motorized vehicles on the beach, if we can avoid it, is not a good idea. So. Guys, are there anything else from your? No, your no, listening? sir. I think if there are changes to the ordinance, they can certainly can be um, considered at the second reading. Chief, thank you. Yes, as sir. always. Next item, discussion of 2022 final report of short-term rentals and 2023 year-to-date short-term rental license issued in your packet. You have a couple, couple of sets of graphs uh, looking at the fiscal year of the licensing through the end of April and then a snapshot of where things stand through June 9th. So Douglas or Desiree, who wants to take that? Um, yeah, I can go ahead and just kind of walk you through the final report. Um, as you can tell at the top, this is a... Can we, let's wait for just a second and get that on the screen. For so it's Amy, it's page 33 through 36 of the packet. Yes. Yes. That's not it. No. Go ahead. All right. Um, I'll go ahead before um, while she uh, puts it up in the screen. But it's page 33, 34, 35, and 36 of the meeting packet that's available on um, the city's website. Um, so this is the final report for license year 2022. This covers the licenses that were issued by our building department from May 1st, 2022 through April 30, 2023. Um, just as a reminder, the dwelling data that we have been using was provided by the county. We will get an updated set of data for 2023 in September when the county does a reassessment. So. In terms of our baseline for dwelling information, we're using the same data set that we receive from the county. When we receive updated numbers, we'll, we'll adjust the analysis moving forward uh, for 2023. Um, as you can see, total short-term rental licenses that were issued in this license year were uh, 1,805. 89% of those, 1,605, were issued to properties that are listed uh, for tax purposes at 6% and 11% or 200 were issued to um, full-time uh, full residents at, at uh, properties that are uh, taxed at the 4% rate. 39% um, total, when you look at the total number of licenses issued, um, divided by that, by the total dwelling units. So not, not much has changed from the uh, last report that you had. Um, we did increase the, the number of total short-term rental licenses from uh, the last report provided by, at the workshop, and that is due to our enforcement efforts at ensuring that those properties that were identified as license, uh, renting without a license, when they came uh, to apply or renew uh, uh, for 2023, and we saw that they were uh, actively renting in 2022, we um, had them uh, pay for and obtain a 2022 license. So that's why that number is different. For, but 1805 for 2022. Um, the next two pages just show a distribution of the short term rentals by gross revenue and um, separated by 4 and 6%. As you can see, about 80% of short term rentals, um, including 4 and 6%. Uh, reported gross revenue of 100,000, 102,000 or less, and 43, 44% of those reported revenues of 52,000 or less for that license year. Um, just to make a point, uh, at the bottom of the graph on, and the, 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 the analysis on page 34, you can see the total reported gross revenue uh, for license year 2022. Um, we are doing a, an analysis tying that back to accommodation tax revenue, what was what we should have received, what was reported. Um, maybe next month we'll be able to, or by the council meeting potentially, we can provide a, a, a more detailed report. We've done some high-level analysis so far, but um, still a little bit of work to do to do on that end. Um, do you think... a quick question on that, Desiree? Where else would we get the uh, ATAX 
contributed revenue just from the hotel rooms at the Sweetgrass and the Boardwalk, those 246 rooms? That's right. So that, other than those two sources, the short-term rental or those hotel rooms, that's our that's our a tax pool. That's correct. correct. Okay, I just want to confirm that. Yes. All right, um, and then the second graph, um, page 35, is also related to license year 2022, and you can see the distribution there by type of dwelling. Um, you can see 50% of, um, of those are single family homes, and 43% are condo or specialty condo. And just for the, for the benefit of the public, specialty condo refers to the rooms for the Palms Hotel, Seaside Inn, they operate somewhat like hotels, but they have a short-term rental license. They're, they're privately owned. Um, so we, we treat them, they, they behave very much like hotel rooms. So we treat them separately. So that's what, that's what that category means. Are there any questions for 2022 before I go to 2023? No, no wait for 2023. All right, so for 2023, again, just reminding you about the dwelling data, we're using the same numbers from 2022 from the county. Um, when we get updated uh, data, we'll, we'll make an adjustment there. Yeah, and just for clarity, Amy, if you'll highlight the distribution, the box chart on the left, middle, that, that data is static. Correct. To, to Desiree's comments. So we get that from the county September-ish, yes, give or take, and we'll update that when we, when we have that. You're talking about the 4440? This right here? Yeah. Yeah. Or the, or the distribution the, the year distribution, to year? The distribution and yes. the counts. Yeah. So that's static from the one you just looked at, Scott, until we get the, the updates. new data from county in September. Okay. And if we want to in the next uh, iteration or sometime down the road, can we break those out a little bit further by any chance? Like when we have the 6%, the, uh, I call them the second, I guess I'm, I'm kind of with Mr. Yeah. Santiago on the second oh. homes, breaking out the second homes and then the ones that have rentals. And then even with the primary 4%, the 4% that are primaries and the 4% that have rentals. That way we can see a trend across going. And I'd suggest we change it from uh, investment to non-residents. So we're comparing resident dwellings with non-resident dwellings, which is comparable to the 4%, 6%. Yeah. The, the, the reason it's showing like that, that's how the county categorizes yeah, no, those properties. Yep. So that's, we were just trying to be consistent, but we can certainly make that adjustment. Right. Um, okay, so for license year 2023, so that means licenses that were um, uh, issued s starting May 1st, 2023, and that'll run until April 30th of 2024. Uh, the records and the numbers um, on the top right-hand side, when we look at the number of licenses issued, that's our records. So um, from, from the city's building department, licenses issued, same thing as 2022. And those are um, these numbers reflect the licenses issued as of June 9th, 2023. Um, that shows 16, uh, uh, 1633, 1,633 licenses issued so far in, in those two two months, essentially. It's one month, right? It includes May, up May 1st June, through... June. Six weeks. Six like weeks, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, May 1st through June, June 9th. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see, so we've been, we want to be very consistent at showing licenses issued so that we're comparing apples to apples. But... I know that there is a lot of interest in knowing what's been, um, what's pending, what's what's not yet issued. So we've included two categories here. I'm sorry, um, two categories here. Um, unlicensed rentals identified by Rentalscape. So these are the properties that the city's pursuing that show up as, you know, having active listings and not having a license. Um, and then 56 that are in the queue. Um, what that means is they've submitted some documentation um, either our clerks are waiting for additional documentation from these applications or they've been sent an invoice and they have not yet paid um, for that license. So they may or may not turn into a license, but it's somewhere in the process. It's somewhere in the process. Gotcha. Um, in these nine Jaces after those, I'm assuming, at this point. Not, not yet. Not yet. Got it. Yeah, they've just been close. identified. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think these two buckets are good just because it gives us a little bit of a forward indicator yeah. because if they're in the queue, it's likely, I'm guessing, people aren't going to apply for a license if they're not intending to get it. It's just the process of trying to get all the paperwork in. So I think this gives us a little bit of a headlight for maybe what's coming down next month. 
And the other thing that I wanted to point out is the pie chart on the bottom, that just um, is, is reflecting licenses issued. So if you assume that the 65 between the unlicensed rentals and those that are in the queue um, become uh, issued licenses, that distribution of what now called investment properties with I an IOP SDR goes from 33 to 34%. But just making sure that, that everybody understands that the pie chart just reflects the number of licenses issued, Issue. not the ones that are in the queue. Gotcha. So that's all I have. Are there any questions? Yep. Yeah. Got one. Yep. So total dwelling units overall, 2022 was uh, percentage with short-term rental license, 39%. For 2023, it's 36%. Am I reading that correctly? You are. You so just keep in mind that the thirty-nine percent reflects twelve months mm -hmm. of issued licenses, right. and the thirty-six just reflects the six five six weeks. Based on your experience, I mean, if we were to um, project um, that thirty-six percent number is not going to, based on your experience of people coming and getting licensed throughout the year. That's not going to be materially different at the end of the year. I don't. I don't, don't know. know. I don't know. I mean, it depends. Do you have a whole lot of people coming in in July or in August getting short-term rental license? Uh, Douglas, I, I oversees the building department. He has more direct experience with that, so I would rely on that. I think it's very difficult to, to make assumptions at this point, but um, it's not an assumption. It's just there's a, a lot of activity. Can you take I'm a stab at it? <laughs> I, I think Desiree is correct that we, we really don't know what the trickle could be five a month it could be 25 a month you know and, and the difference between those two is obviously meaningful when you when you push it out for the entire calendar year um, so we it's it's just hard for us to predict that I but think, I think we, we do have a record last year though, though right we have a reference right. points from last year right yeah, yeah. We went from about from 14, July. yeah. We went from about fourteen hundred at the start to eighteen hundred at the end. So I mean, that's a that's a rough number. We had a four hundred increase during the course of the year. A that's whole lot that's been well we'll to worry on conversation that yeah, a whole lot of discussion about. It. Took. But, but I guess if you think, and if you're in the rental business, and I have a rental house, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna get a license for the whole year for the most part. Majority of all in, who knows what's going to trickle before the year finishes out. So, Jan. I was just going to say, um, I would like to see what it was for last year and then account for if it was 400 last year, even if it's 200, we cut it down to 200 this year. That still puts us in the 1800 plus uh, number that we have now. Um, and could you look at last year and just figure out what percentage of your licenses came in in the first six weeks? Six weeks as opposed over the course of the year to see sure. what that is. Yeah, I mean, some uh, of it's going to be processing time and staff we had at the yeah. time. Right. Might have processed more last year, might not have. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that's an apples and apples, but yeah. I mean, they can certainly pull it. And the housing market slowed down, so you might not have as much turnover or anything else this year, so who knows? Rusty. And if I remember yeah, correctly, I think there was a lot of, of discussion by city council about yeah. this, and some people, we don't know what that number is, it's not finite went out and got a license last year that never had one before because of what was being discussed. I think you can see the number of, well, and again, you're comparing the 2022 numbers for 12 months. We had 204% mm. license, uh, licenses issued to properties uh, tax at 4%. That number has gone slightly down to 142, potentially 157 if the number of those that are pending um, actually result in a license. So that may be where you're seeing some of the folks that may have s s uh, applied for a license, grabbed it last year, and may not do so this year. Um, exactly. But we, we just, it, it's too early to, to tell, right. really, to, you're comparing really well, one month to 12 months. Anything concrete, I'm just looking for trends. Mm -hmm. Rusty. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this just reinforces what that we do what we said we would do as a council is to monitor this that's what we voted to do monitor it going forward make sure we have oversight month to month and controls in place and uh, personnel in place to look at these numbers and instead of speculating what may be let's look at it actually you know month to month and, and stay on top of it I mean the early report right here to me looks like that uh, 
you know, that we have uh, less of a problem than some might have thought that we had and that things look to be pretty stable overall. So I'm in favor of us just as a council continuing to do what we said we would do and voted to do. Desiree Douglas, other questions, comments? No, nope. thank you. Good. All right. Thank you all for graphing and doing all that. It'll be interesting to get the next set of county data and have that update. That'll be good information as well. Next item is environmental. We've already talked about item one. Item two, discussion of recommendation from the Planning Commission to approve a proposal from Seaman and Whiteside for the development of a sea level rise adaptation plan. Douglas? Yes. Um, you'll recall that this was in your budget for uh, this year. We're obviously at the tail end of that, that fiscal year, um, and we're just now getting to bringing this to you. But this has been a, a little bit of a process that the Planning Commission has taken on here recently. They developed an RFP um, packet. It went out. Uh, we had two respondents to that packet. The Planning Commission uh, interviewed both respondents and graded those respondents. And their <coughs> grades back from the Planning Commission were very close. Um, they were within kind of 10% of each other. Uh, from a grading standpoint, and the Planning Commission recommended that you all move forward with the lowest um, cost proposal. So after they did the interviews, we got proposals from both firms, and based on uh, the Planning Commission's recommendation, that yielded a recommendation to engage um, Seaman and Whiteside. Seaman and Whiteside gave us a proposal for I believe it's 30, 35,300. 35,3. Yeah. Um, you will have 20,000 in the budget. Um, I will say that there was, so that's obviously over budget. The other, um, the other respondent also gave, they gave a, um, they gave a proposal for what was in the, what was uh, in the RFP. And their cost for that was about 50. They also came up with an alternate um, proposal that where they scale back the scope of the RFP to get it within the city's $20,000 budget. So there was kind of different ways of pricing it. Um, and, and ultimately, uh, if we take the Planning Commission's recommendation, it would be to engage Seaman and Whiteside at the amount over budget, but on, uh, on the scope that was presented. Yep. Okay. Um, first of all, um, I was a consultant for years and wrote a lot of proposals. I just want to say there are two things to consider when hiring professional consultants. We are not buying a Ford 150 where you go to the, the different lots, it's all identical material that you're getting. You just pick the one that's giving you the best price on the same truck. So when you're when you're dealing with professional um, firms, engineering or engineering firms, architecture firms, and things like that, you consider who has the expertise you want, the best qualified people to hire. Then you might consider, with this one, you might consider what they can do for the price. Um, and a lot of the ones I proposed for, they actually knew what the city, what the municipal budget is because it's public, and they would craft their um, proposal to match that dollar amount. So going at it the way it was done is sort of unusual because they just went ahead and one of them sounds like gave you the, you know, the Cadillac and the other one probably tried to get closer to the budget. Well, just, just for clarity, um, the Planning Commission interviewed and graded both respondents based on their response to the, to the RFP. Yeah. So they, they did, that is, that was part of the process to choose the best respondent but the scores were so close, they felt like the deciding factor should be the cost. Perhaps. Okay. But that Thank was you. after a pretty exhaustive interview and okay. review process of each of their proposals against the published scope. And okay. their qualifications. And their qualifications, yeah. okay. correct. Good. Well, that's, that's the way I would hope it would be done. Good. Thank you. Um, the second, question, second yeah, part of this is then, just one more, is um, 
was the other firm a firm that has worked with us on and has a history with the city or not? Not not directly. Um, the they partner though with Stephen Trainum, um, who we obviously do have um, experience with, who's here mm -hmm. tonight. Okay. Um, so part of the team we did have uh, a lot of direct contact with okay. the um, Seaman and Whiteside who who is ultimately being recommended their team is made up of the same engineers that we have been using for the right, drainage yeah. master plan so we do have That's a familiarity I mean. okay. with with that firm um, sure. so they they definitely have uh, knowledge of the island's topography and, and vulnerabilities and uh, terrain. Yeah, thank so, you. So I we have both of my questions. Go ahead. So I want them answered. That's right. So essentially, we have two <laughs> options. We can either accept the proposal for thirty-five-three from Seaman Whiteside, even though it's over budget by about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars, or we can go back and revise the scope to make it closer to the twenty thousand dollars that we have in the budget. That's the decision point that, that we need to make. Yeah. I mean, I would go with the Planning Commission's recommendations. They vetted all this personally. Jimmy? Yeah, just one quick note to follow up on Douglas. That we have extensive experience with Seaman and White, Whiteside. No, well, not really with Seaman and Whiteside, but with the engineers that they have fairly recently hired from Davis and Floyd. Right, they, with the, they same, have been yeah, first the same personnel. Correct. correct. So they're proven. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, one suggestion, you can always go back to them and, and ask them to, to sharpen their pencils one more time if that's, if that's an issue. I don't think we're going to get close to 20000 but okay. they can always tell you what it is that you, you know, to get a decent project. Uh, the, the budget amount is being funded by the Beach Preservation Fee Fund, so there, is, there are funds available yeah. um, to cover the additional cost. Well, we'll see in a minute. We've got budget overages, too, that will... We can cover it from multiple places. That's right. So. All right. You good, Douglas? Yes. Um, public services update on RFP process to hire a parking vendor for the island for 2024 beach season in your packet. Desiree had prepared a timeline. So, Desiree, you want to run through Yeah, that just quick? very quickly. Um, as I reported last month, we issued a request for proposals pretty quickly after the decision made by council that we pursue a procurement for these services. Um, the uh, staff reached out to six um, firms, management, uh, parking management firms, making sure that they were aware of the RFB. Um, the deadline for questions was this past Friday. We've received uh, a, a, a lot of questions from four firms, which is a good sign. Um, we will host a mandatory pre-bid meeting um, this Friday, and then two weeks from then, we will have the deadline for proposals. Uh, we have been requested by, uh, I recall one, maybe two, whether or not the city is going to extend the deadline for proposals, depending on how many questions there are um, at the pre-bid meeting. They might have to go back to and, and refine their proposals. Um, we will make that determination on Friday. We do not think there is a need, but, you know, particularly having been given at least a month between advertising and um, having the deadline for questions. But um, I'll keep you all updated if, if, we, make, if we make that decision. So um, once we've received proposals, we'll vet them and present them to the Public Safety Committee so we can go through the process and maybe call um, um, a few of them to present to the committee or to the workshop. And we can have that conversation about the right path. but. Um, we should be in good shape um, from what I, from what I'm seeing so far. Next item, thank you, Desiree. Next item, discussion of timeline for the Waterway Boulevard pedestrian path elevation project and options. Again, in your packet, uh, you've got a quick project summary and kind of and a timeline and, and an update actually from from Swint, the Public Services Committee met. You recall this project has been discussed for a number of years. Um, we have funds in this year's budget to cover the project. We also have a FEMA uh, grant request in, in the works. Um, to Desiree, you want to give us a quick update here? Yes. Um, so the, the slide describes what the project is. Um, we have been talking about making improvements to the pathway at Waterway Boulevard and as part of the work with master planning and, and, and talking about what can the city be doing 
to enhance our protection from title and, 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 and um, improve our stormwater management, this came up as a project that was feasible and something that the, our engineers recommended that we pursue. To that effect, um, Thomas and Hutton was hired to do a very pre preliminary design and preliminary assessment. Um, that is what we use to submit a grant for from the state, ultimately funded by FEMA. Um, they received $32 million as part of the hazard mitigation grant program related to COVID-19 um, monies from the CARES Act. Um, the state has um, identified our project as a, as a top priority, which is really good. We are not competing with the entire uh, nation. We are just competing with state project, which is something that was clarified to me when we had a meeting with the state folks last week. Um, the cost estimate of this project is a million one. This, this grant, if funded, would cover 90% of that in addition to about $54,000 of um, management costs that are not included in that, um, in that 90%. Um, really good news that the city, that the state has um, designated this, case, this, this um, project as a top priority. It's fully expected to be funded. Obviously, the final decision comes from FEMA. Um, we are aware that the, our application is in the final stages of, of review from FEMA because they have been requesting information of our engineers and our grant writer, which is a really good sign. Um, what we have been told it is highly unusual that, it, that there has to be something uh, very dramatic that they find from the design or the cost that would uh, prevent them from fully funding this project as requested, but obviously we won't know that until the final grant allocations are announced at the um, first quarter of 2024. Even though our application is in the final stages, FEMA will wait until they review all projects before making an announcement. Um, we have, um, we were able to adjust our application to include some pre-award cost of about 157,000, um, 137 for engineering and 20,000 for permitting, which means that we are able to move forward and engage and start working on those two specific um, um, actions, those two, two specific um, uh, work uh, scopes of work um, before being announced, before the announcement and not lose any eligibility on, on the grant. The only difference is that we have to follow federal procurement guidelines before engaging an engineering firm to start that work. Um, that means that we are not, a, just because Thomas and Hutton uh, uh, has helped in the development of this process and uh, prepared the preliminary design and uh, feasibility study, we can't hire them as a sole source because they're, 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 um, right. they've been working with us. So we have to go through that process, which is something that we can do in the next week or two uh, to get that ball rolling. But that would allow us to start working on this project and some of the soft costs before um, being notified. The only caveat to that, and, and I think we fully expect if we are not successful in the grant for whatever reason, which is not expected, but could happen, that we are responsible for those costs. But as the mayor indicated, we've included the expenditure of this project in the budget. Yeah. In the event that we're not successful, we have monies allocated to, to move forward. Rusty. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, this is a lot more optimistic than what we heard at public services yes. and facilities. This meetings. is new, new information. New yeah. information. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, I won't go through all of it, but it looked like that there was going to be really a longer timeline in terms of permitting and a lot of questions as to whether we'd even get the FEMA grant or not. So this is very encouraging. I saw to say that the, the committee was unanimously in favor of, you know, bringing this to council and discussing it and seeing if we needed to do something different other than waiting for a FEMA grant. But this looks pretty good here. Mm -hmm. So the, just to clarify, the permitting process and the engineering process, I mean, those are long, those are long processes. We know we've, we've seen with the drainage projects over a year between us uh, submitting for an application for a permit um, and actually receiving permitting. Right. What this means is rather than having to wait until 
uh, May of next year before we know whether or not we're going to be funded to then start the engineering and start the permitting, we can do that now. But the permitting process, you know, who knows, could, could, could take a yeah, year. We're just not having to start it next May. Correct. We can start it now rather than start it next year. Yeah. I always call it pre-award money, like, really? Yeah, I, I really think it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I kind of like really, really money. Desiree, what, anything else? Nothing else. We'll just pursue really with, yeah, with starting the procurement process for engineering and permitting. And um, once we have that, we'll it'll, it'll come before you all for approval. Okay. Very good. Katie, do you have a question? Excellent. No. I was, yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. Got it. Next item, discussion of recommendation from the Public Services and Facilities Committee to approve proposal from Applied Technology Management for the engineering design and permitting of marina dredging project. And again, you've got that RFP re response in your packet. Desiree, what else on? Um, I, I don't have the amount here, um, but it's 100, 105,000. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we procured this, only received one, one proposal. We did reach out to another company that we have used in the past for dredging. They're very busy, and they um, uh, sent me their uh, regrets for not being able to submit a proposal. But I think we're in good hands with ATM. They have a long history with the city, a lot of experience with the marina, and I fully recommend that we uh, move forward with this. The FY24 budget includes $50,000 for this work, but as you all remember, we received a state grant allocation, a state allocation of a million five that will cover the entire cost of this project. From, so, the, yeah, from the budget. Correct, yep. and there's no, those are not restricted to construction only. They could be used for engineering, permitting, and design as well. Okay. So this will become come before you all for final approval at your council meeting. Yeah. And again, this was, you heard from our lobbyists, this was good work on their part to get this in the budget. And I think we've already drawn these funds down, right? Yes, we have, those, down. we have those funds um, in, yeah. in the bank. <laughs> Next item, the personnel discussion of Ordinance 2023-09 to clarify position of city attorney and to include provisions for the appointment of city prosecutor. Uh, we've had past, past first reading last month, referred back to administration committee, or John or Desiree, anything to update or? I think this is to, to document what we actually do. We so it's, yeah. It's yeah, this essentially allows the city to, uh, it just clarifies that the city council has the ability to, fought, to hire a uh, either an individual as a city attorney or the firm which is the direction we recently went to the only addition here is a um, we're codifying that it is city council's um, appointment for the city prosecutor that was not um, included in the in the ordinance and we think it's important that it is rather than some uh, an attorney that is hired by the city administrator um, so that, that is the uh, other change that is included in that red line. Okay, and we'll have second reading at council later this month. Yes, sir. Next item, other items under E. First one, discussion of ordinance 2023-10 to authorize the city to enter into an intergovernmental agreement related to the South Carolina local revenue services to participate in one or more local revenue service programs to execute and deliver one or more participant program supplements and other matters. We had first reading on this last month. We have second reading this month. Desiree, this is highly an administrative function, but anything else to add there? It it's is. a lot of words for an administrative <laughs> word. <laughs> I mean, this is a very, you know, a little bit of cleanup from the Municipal Association. Uh, the city has participated in, in, with the Municipal Association for, good Lord, decades. Um, they will continue to collect these tax, um, insurance tax and the broker's tax and the telecommunications tax program on behalf of the city. They're just calling it a different, they're calling it different names. They are making this agreement some sort of intergovernmental agreement. It's the same across the board. Everybody who's participating in those programs, we should not see any changes in the operation of those programs. Um, they're or, just or revenue or revenue yeah. and any of that. I think they're just cleaning up their the the, the agreement, cleaning up the um, agreements to make sure that they're consistent with the names, the new names for the program, and uh, consistent with the Business License Standardization Act. So, um, the, I mean, I can go into a little bit more detail. I don't think you want me to. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Fair enough. Just in the title. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you, Desiree. Yeah. Next item, discussion and consideration of 2023 surfing lessons applications from Kai Dilling, so, so surfers. That's in your packet, I believe. Desiree, anything? Yes, I, I think believe. this is the seventh. Yes, I believe this is the seventh application you have received so far. Uh, Mr. Kai did receive an application for uh, a permit last year. He wants to renew it. Um, I think there is a desire of maybe uh, attempting to speed up the approval process to allow him to provide classes this month. That's the reason why it's listed on your agenda as consideration. So if it is the will of, of the council to suspend the rules and vote to approve this permit application tonight rather than at the council meeting at the end of the month. That's certainly an option if you all vote and approve that. All right, just move the in order. Second. And uh, to allow voting. To allow discussion on this matter tonight. To allow discussion and, and yeah. action. Well, discussion and action. Okay. Yes. All right. You yeah. said that. Right. Same. That. Second. So we just need to have a vote. So. And Nicole, you've got a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Myers. Yep. Yeah. Discussion questions. We have to vote on the motion, don't we? Okay. Don't we, we discuss the, first? Well, no, no, you have to, we have to of order. suspension oh, oh, the rules. Oh, gotcha. So all those in favor of suspending the rules of order? Aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Um, so, go ahead. Oh, You're first. Yeah. So I mean, I, I've spoken to Kai, and he's very apologetic. He thought that he had done everything that he was supposed to do, and he hadn't. Um, and he is willing to. Um, I know there's been discussions about having, you know, making sure it's not too crowded in one area. He's willing to pretty much do anything that we want um, if he can get this done <laughs> tonight <laughs> so he can start doing lessons like tomorrow. Um, well, yeah. Well, Kyle's kind of very well known on the island. He's been teaching kids surfing lessons for a long, long, long time. And he's, he's got all of the proper paperwork and qualifications and things that he needs. Yeah, yeah and I, I would. But everybody know. knows Kai. Sorry, Go ahead, that's it. Uh, just a couple of comments from my side. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't think any of us want to get in the habit of having votes at a workshop. That's not the intent right. or the purpose, and we're talking about two weeks. My real concern with this one is this person had a couple of conversations with staff, didn't like the answers, and have come to council to expedite this. Somebody going around our staff does not make me feel very good at all for doing business with somebody, to be quite honest with you. I could care less who teaches on our island. I, didn't know I don't care if there's this. 10 of them. You know, we, I think we need to do need to talk next year about, you know, do we want to limit the number potentially? Do we want to designate an area of the island or whatever we want to do? But um, that's, a, that's a next year conversation. And again, I, I'm glad we're doing surf lessons. I'm, it's great. I just have a real concern with somebody that goes around our staff like that. But if, we, if the will of council wants to vote it tonight, great. Well, Mayor, I, 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 can I? Can I respond? I'd like, yeah. I mean, I feel like I need to respond to that, though. I mean, I, I guess maybe staff should, too. But, I mean, from my conversations with him, it, it's, it's an ordinance that requires a vote. So he was just reaching out to me as a council person to ask if there was any way that we could vote on this. So, I mean, that's... After he'd been told the path and the other six knew the path. But he made a mistake, and it was an honest mistake. But, I mean... It's not like he was going, <laughs> he, was, he was following the procedure that the ordinance calls for, and the ordinance requires a vote. And it does that. It doesn't call for people to go around our staff to come to council to solve an administrative issue. Is but staff point. can't allow, can't, staff can't vote. So. Correct. I think next Correct. year we have talked about setting up a deadline for all applications to right. be submitted at the same and time, and we'll make sure that we communicate that to everybody who's received a permit in the past. And that time, you can consider all applications at one time. If there are any concerns about location, we can we can kind of handle that at the same at the same time. Much it would be much easier from an administrative perspective of receiving these applications. So I'm hopeful that that change certainly uh, will will propose that we change that for next year. Yeah, and, I, and Katie, you're right. They can't make a determination but again the conversation was had that you have to wait till council meeting to have a vote because we don't vote at workshops i mean again not that big a deal it just concerns me when people go around i think staff. it is a big deal though from the standpoint of I'm, I'm not talking about going around the system as much as i am these I'm, I'm concerned because we set these workshops up to 
to, to have workshops, not to have another council meeting. And I, I don't want to set a precedent that we start getting into saying a lot of exceptions here where we start voting on issues that then de facto becomes a second council meeting for the month. That's not the way these things were intended. They were intended to work through issues and then bring them to council. So, I mean, we've already gone through that. I think we voted and said we can consider it, but I, it concerns me that we start using workshops as a place that we start voting and, like I said, becomes a de facto second council meeting of the month. Yeah, I, I, I share the same concerns that Council Member Bogosian does in regards to setting a precedent here. In a workshop where we've stated we would not be taking votes and making votes uh, and you know, we don't need to start a, or set a new precedent where we're doing that routinely. I also have the same concerns that the mayor did in that I clearly saw the communication that went to the to the person here making the request and uh, there was a process to follow and you know that would be decided at this month's council meeting on the 26th, 27th, whatever it is. Um, and it's to go around that process after he had been instructed that that's the way to go. Uh, to me, just not just not smack of uh, uh, being straight up with us. I I basically can't support it for that reason. Uh, quite honestly, when we get down to it, because uh, I would rather us make a council make a vote at council in regards to this matter. And I know. I know this gentleman here has done business on this island for many years. I've lived here for 40 years. I know of him very well and watched him before when he operated on Isle of Palms and did a great job for many, many years. So it's nothing personal. It's just uh, uh, I think we should follow the rules that we have in place. Uh, so okay, I have a question. You can make, you can make a, any council can request a special meeting. <laughs> There's a procedure to do that. Um, I had I thought that we could um, avoid the necessity of that headache of bringing everyone here another day um, and we are all here so I mean I believe it takes correct me if I'm wrong I believe it takes a vote of six to request a special meeting is that correct five or is it still just five five yes ma'am so if five people are in favor of it and we're sitting here today the fact that I thought it would be nicer to do it when everyone is here rather than tomorrow or last week, which actually would have been helpful. Um, I feel like we're making a, a mountain out of a molehill here. Um, yep, but. I totally agree. Jane? I have a question. Didn't you, we call a special meeting before the workshop? For executive session. But we had to go into, spe go into a special meeting first to then go into executive session. And I just, I suggested that we could bring it up then because I was definitely not in favor of having a, a special council meeting just for this person who had missed a deadline. But I thought that would have been a way to at least, he would have pe been penalized with not being able to work for two weeks, but still have that in case, I, I just don't understand. But I also don't understand the background of this. It sounds like there's a lot that I, I wasn't aware of in terms of the person um, that was making the application. Yeah, I was just making the comment. You saw the email traffic. If you want to make a motion, we'll take it up. Uh, can I just add one? Can yeah. I ask one question yeah. uh, before we do that? Yes. Is there another way to accommodate this situation? I mean, I, it sounds to me like this guy's been here for quite some time. We're at our seventh yeah. surfing, and I, it, is, it, is a, it is a bit of a mountain over a molehill. If everybody is, is uh, accommodating to, you know, have him do his business on the, on the beach, is there another way than disrupting the meeting? We've got, we've got suspension of rules of order. I would say make a motion and let's go for it. Because it, it has to be voted on. So, we, we, yes, we could have had a meeting at four. Um, we need a motion. We to make a motion. That that we'll go with it. Uh, the most efficient. We, th we, I, we thought this would be more efficient. So, so I make apologize. a motion and we'll go with it. Motion that. to approve the surfing lessons. Second. Any other discussions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. You good? Just Council for Streetman voted against it. Thank you. Next item is financial review. Well, Debbie. Lovello. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Lovello. Rusty, already had to check. All right. Discussion for Lovello on June 22nd. Desiree sent an email 
today, I think, or yesterday with the information. Um, yesterday. For that, yesterday. So, Rusty, mm -hmm. you want to? Yeah, thank you. Friend. Thank you. Uh, well, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, we do have the Lo Lovello event that takes place on the island here in November. And, uh, you know, we have the finishing uh, area for Lovello. And it's a combination of, you know, different length bicycle rides. And it's all for the benefit of the Hollings Cancer Center. And uh, it's a great event. It's well attended. Last year we had great weather. We had uh, excellent, excellent participation from the rec center, from our safety department, Desiree, the whole group, and along with Lovella, we just had a, a good finish to the event. Well, year before weather not so the year before we were it was a rain out, but we still had <laughs> pretty decent uh, participation uh, in spite of that, and they limited the ride to only ten miles long instead of having the uh, century ride a hundred miles and the fifty mile as well. But all that to say is I just wanted to pass along to the rest of council that they do have a new uh, event that they've planned this year and it's next Thursday June the 22nd from 5 30 to 7 30 at the Harbor Club at West Edge and um, it's basically uh, you know complimentary hors d'oeuvres and cocktails but more importantly it's, a, it's an opportunity for you all to learn more about what the Hollings Cancer Center does what Lovello does and to also uh, just learn more about the event. So we wanted to extend an invitation to all of the council members and uh, being on their executive board, uh, I, I told them I would pass that along to all of you. And any of you that are interested, uh, please feel free to, to be there for that. It's from 5.30 to 7.30 on June the 22nd. And if you also have other friends, family, or colleagues that might be interested in attending, just let me know and I'm sure we can work them in also. So it's for a great cause, a great event, and uh, I would just encourage you to try to get out there and attend this. Thanks. Thank you. Debbie, financial review in our packet. This is through May, so one more month left in our fiscal year. Oh, we're almost there. Hard to believe, yeah. Okay. Nothing um, major out of the ordinary to talk about. Uh, general fund revenues are at 96% of the budget, and total fund revenues are 90% of the budget. The target for 11 months into the fiscal year would be 92%, so general fund is, is trending ahead of budget. On the expenditure side, the general fund is at 92%, so right on target. Total, all funds is at 75%. So we will not spend as much money um, on the expenditure side as the budget predicted. The biggest, uh, the biggest difference is drainage phase three, which has been rebudgeted into FY24. And then there's some other smaller projects that either came in under budget or we would have moved them into FY24. General fund revenues. Drilling down into those, you can see that property taxes, business licenses, rental licenses, and building permits are already over budget 11 months into the fiscal year. Uh, uh, currently, the forecast is that we'll beat the revenue budget in the general fund by about $2 million. On the expenditure side in the general fund, still predicting that we'll be over budget around $800,000, but that might be a little too conservative. I think when all is said and done, we'll probably be more like $600,000 over budget. But all funds will bring in more revenue than they have expenditures, so we should see a, a buildup of all fund balances. So that's good news. Cash balances, the city has about $39 million in cash. $37 million of that is at the LGIP, and the interest rate for May was 5.27%. So we're getting some good interest income. Wow. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, excited about that I know, it makes me excited. Yeah. Two million a year, rough yeah. numbers in interest income. Yeah. 5%, yeah. 5.2. That's pretty good. That's pretty strong. Uh, let's see. Um, in June, 
So this month, the city made the final principal and interest payment on the RAC bond issued in 2003. Mm -hmm. right. We should have had a mortgage burning, but we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the debt service millage, as y'all know, will go down in September to reflect that debt coming off the city's books. And Debbie, I think it was one mil, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. right. Yep. Every little bit helps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's in the right direction. Mm -hmm, for sure. <laughs> Every little meal helps, yeah. <laughs> also of note, I wanted to mention that the marina restaurant has now been operating for a full year. Um, the lease requires, y'all might recall this, a statement from a CPA confirming gross revenue. Uh, the tenant has submitted a proposed list of agreed upon procedures that their CPA would perform to meet this requirement. Um, the staff has shared um, the proposal with our CPA, which is Darius, and with Brian Kitts to get their opinion. Um, they feel that um, what the tenant is proposing is adequate and the staff agrees, but we want to get off on the right foot, so we would, would like City Council to bless that um, proposal. So we will prepare something to include in the Council packet to let y'all see that at the Council meeting and get your vote, yeah, your name. And the reason we're doing this is the report that we would get from them does not include the specific language that the lease includes. Remember, the lease was written by a real estate attorney, not a CPA firm. So I just want to make sure that under my purview, <laughs> we are enforcing these list leases to, to the T. And I just want to get buy-in from council that this document and this report that they're, that they're providing to the city to meet that lease requirement is acceptable to the city and will be acceptable for the entire length of the lease. So we'll be providing that. And just as an FYI, those financials are protected from, dis from, from public distribution. So we will uh, make sure that we share whatever uh, we can in terms of the procedures that they're proposing and um, get a blessing from council that that is acceptable. Can I have a, ask a couple quick questions? Um, at this time, do you know if um, tax return, um, tax returns will be included in these agreed upon procedures or that an income tax return or sales tax returns? So we, they, they submit a copy of their ST3T every month. Okay. So this would just be some agreed upon procedures to confirm those numbers. Right, and that's just gross receipts. Mm -hmm. I mean, net of sales tax, of course. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and hospitality tax. And, you know, liquor by the drink tax, and the 14%, whatever. Uh, well, I'm glad to see we're doing this. We, we had problems in the past down there, uh, and we all remember. You know, a previous tenant, which just could never can could never quite nail it down. So I'm really glad to hear this. Good, Good job. All right, moving on to uh, tourism revenues. Um, I'm just going to talk about a couple because there hasn't been much activity on the non-monthly pages. But municipal accommodations fee, the um, April number is low. You can see $24,000 compared to 82 in the prior year. Um, reaching out to the county, um, the, the comment I got back was that the county was overwhelmed in the month with business licenses. They have the same now state mandated um, due date as the city has, and we know how busy we've been. So they were overwhelmed with business licenses, and they said also a lot of um, rentals, uh, accommodation taxpayers are switching their management companies for some reason. So those are the two reasons they listed and they said our next check for next month will be $467,000. So half of that would be 233, which would be more in line with the trends we've been seeing. Yeah. So um, if you add that in, we'd be at 8% increase over FY21, which lines up pretty good with the next page, the state A tax 9% increase. Yeah. And those are slightly different time periods, but still you can see the kind of the equivalent trend. No new county A tax money, hospitality tax, another strong month in April, well, for May, 
April um, consumption. So we're 20% ahead of the prior year in hospitality tax after being 57% ahead of the prior year. So lots of eating, eating and, and drinking. drinking. <laughs> Can't get rid of tequila then, can you? <laughs> Beach preservation fee, we've already talked about. Um, local option sales tax, strong month, 10% ahead. We still have three months, three big months to collect in this fiscal year. There were no, there was no activity on the project worksheet, so we haven't, we do not have those. So I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Debbie. Oh. Thank you, Debbie, very much. Next item, procurement. First is approval of purchase of 16 ballistic vests for fire department personnel in an amount not to exceed 28,000 to be funded by the 150,000 approved allocation to enhance emergency response and beach safety. So, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is something that we discussed with the Public Safety Committee meeting, uh, the special meeting that we held after the shooting that we had at the beach, and this was one another recommendation that was um, shared there, um, was not included in the final list that you all saw when 150000 was approved by council, but it was part of the, the, the same conversation of what, what we can do to enhance safety and um, beach safety and, and, and certainly protect protect our personnel. Um, this is being recommended by the fire department. Um, I support this purchase. Um, the it, it would be funded by the by the allocation that's already been approved, but because of the amount, it requires an approval from from city council. So this will be included at the city council meeting for action as well. Why why sixteen? The number sixteen. One. Uh, so it's one per uh, person on a shift, mm -hmm. and including uh, some administrative staff like the fire chief, the battalion chief for training. So it won't be one per person. It's one per position, if you will. Very good. Next item is approval of purchase of four tide valves for Merritt Boulevard, two there, one on Driftwood Lane, and one on Carolina <coughs> Boulevard in an amount of 35520 to be funded by the Drainage Contingency Fund, which I think has over $300,000 in it, rough numbers. This is, uh, these are some real hot spot areas, as some of you may know, if you've had email traffic or live in these areas. Um, so we're just using some of our contingency funds to put in a valve like we did at 25th. That'll hopefully yeah. alleviate merits some mad driftwood to mess. Merit's probably the worst of all the three of these, but this will be a good add for us. So. Yes, and this is being proposed as a sole source contract. Included in your packet is a memo making that justification. Essentially, there's only two manufacturers that do that. those types of, of uh, valves. And this particular one produces one that is much easier to maintain, can be removed, cleaned out, and, and put back in. So that's why we're recommending that we um, that we approve that city council approves this this uh, purchase. Again, final vote will come to uh, the city council meeting for action. That seems like it seems like great price. Is that? Uh, no, for something that's going <laughs> we're afraid to say that out loud. <laughs> Well, they're, they're about 8,000 people. Four, <laughs> four, four, four of them. Four yeah. of them. Yeah. Eight. Yeah. And eight are we, Robert or somebody, are they on hand? Are we got supply chain issues or any idea? I was told that they're down in Florida. It's about five to ten Okay. Days. Cool. Nice. That'll be a big pickup for those residents in that area for sure, in those areas. Yep. Um, sorry, Desiree, anything else on that one? No, sir. You're good. Um, capital projects update. There's not a whole lot of updates there. You've got the report in your packet. Desiree, are you okay if we bypass you? You know, maybe. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, let me know. Not a whole lot of activity. Um, the only thing that I do want to highlight is that the public dock and the marina, uh, the public dock permit um, ended the public comment period. No major comments received, which is a good thing. That means that OCRM will likely approve the 16-foot wide uh, uh, dock for, for that area. So ATM is full steam ahead finalizing design so that we can go out for bid. Awesome, that's great. 
uh, only thing, legislative report, John, to your comment earlier about the budget and kind of some of the shenanigans in Columbia that went on there. Um, we do have about a million and a half million for drainage, half a million for some ADA boardwalks that are in this year that are still in the budget, subject to governor veto but those numbers are so small i can't even imagine they would raise to the level so hopefully we'll get good news on that here in the next few weeks or so no further business rusty's turn motion to adjourn second all in favor aye, aye. aye. off aye. record at 732. good job rusty <laughs>